one. Good evening and welcome to the Monday, June 29th, 2020 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm uh, Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the committee. Uh, this meeting is being held online as a Zoom meeting uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law. Um, this meeting is being audio and video recorded by Northampton Open Media, and it is being broadcast live um, on Northampton Open Media, um, as well as I believe um, can be streamed from Northampton Open Media's website. So if you are here to uh, participate in the meeting, um, we'll be having a public comment session. Um, if you want to simply watch the meeting, um, you can also um, go over to those other media channels to just watch the meeting. Um, so uh, we will begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee, please. Member Goldman. Are you going to go in? Member Goldman? Uh, Member Voss. Present. Member Gold. Who need it all? Who need it all? So, folks, if I could just ask everyone who's not on the school yeah, committee, right? please mute yourselves. Um, I gotta get some healthier food, so. Okay, I'm gonna do. Yeah, you need that. Why? Mm. Wow. Thank you. I'm gonna mute all, and see if that helps. Um, so we'll continue with the ro roll call of the school committee, please. You're muted, Annie, so you have to unmute. Thank you. Okay, and I'm also going to ask the school committee, please unmute yourselves while I do this. And I'm, I'm going to ask again because I didn't hear Kayak. Um, Member Goldman? I'm not sure she's here. Um, Member Gold? Mayor Narkowitz? Present. Member Busansky? Present. Member Fallon? Present. Member Seraphie Cox? Present. Member Condon? Present. Member Levy? Member Levy? And Member Kaufman? Present. That's seven present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we can continue to monitor in case our colleagues are having a time, tough time joining the meeting for some reason. Um, so the first item on our agenda tonight is public comment period. Um, so for those who have um, given public comment before, we typically ask folks to use the raise hand function on um, Zoom, um, which you can access through the um, uh, participants menu and you'll have a hand raise uh, button uh, that you can access. Um, if you happen to be calling in, um, you, can actually, um, you can actually do that uh, by pressing star six, I believe, is hand raise. And um, that also allows you to raise your hand. Um, I will be recognizing people in the order in which they raise their hands. And I will be timing folks. Um, don't have a timer built into Zoom, but I'll be timing uh, folks um, on my, my iPhone here and letting you know when you're getting close and asking you to please finish up so that everyone has an equal opportunity to provide three minutes of public comment. So when I, um, when I call your name, if you could just unmute yourself, um, you can turn your video on or off. Uh, please state your name um, uh, and where you live uh, for the record. Um, and so the first person who has their hand raised is Noah Cassis. Hi, uh, my name is Noah Cassis. I am 17 years old. Um, I attend Northampton High School. I live in Ward 1 in Northampton. Um, I'll be brief. Basically, I am speaking in favor of eliminating the position of school resource officer and transitioning to a 
system of uh, not exactly sure what that will, would look like, but I would imagine utilizing um, school therapists or counselors more heavily um, and looking at ways to deal with discipline in school that does not involve police and doesn't feed into the school to prison pipeline. Uh, with that, I yield my time. Mr. Mayor, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Noah. The next person who raised their hand is uh, first name Amy. Amy, if you could um, unmute yourself and um, state your, your full name and where you live and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. I'm Amy Martin, a parent of a high school student. I live in Ward 2. And the last time I spoke before you was right before the schools closed in mid-March and learning became remote as best it could. And I just want to acknowledge the extraordinarily challenging time we're in. And thank you all for working to find our way through the pandemic with as much care and attention to the disparate impacts on vulnerable parts of our community as possible as you discuss plans for school in the fall. But um, returning to March when I was here last with a few others that night, I was here to talk about the death of high school student Nevea Molina at the end of January and the hurtful response by the high school and the district to her death and the need for the district to more, much more comprehensively adopt teaching about social emotional wellness and to more deeply address racism, sexism, bias and bullying in our school community. Sadly, the spread of the pandemic overrode the possibility of the school community grieving Nevea's death together. And here we are now with the equally devastating but much longer term pandemic of racism rocking our country and city once again. The steps the city is taking to reimagine public safety have led to the school resource officer being eliminated, at least for now, as we all know, from our schools. And frankly, as a parent and community member, I'm relieved. I don't believe armed officers in the schools are appropriate. And I believe that the interwoven issues of racism the disparate rates of discipline on students of color in Northampton schools, and what role a school resource officer could ever have in addressing these complex issues are more relevant than ever. A hope that as you develop alternatives to the SRO, SRO role for the next school year, you will use this opportunity to begin to develop truly just ways to prevent and address conflict and harm within our schools. I don't know the status of the code of conduct that has been in revision, but it could represent a profound opportunity to re-envision justice in our schools. There are, as Noah mentioned, many models of restorative justice which have adopted in Northampton would have a profound effect on school culture and let our Northampton schools teach the values of equity and compassion that I know we all share. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next uh, person who has um, raised their hand is Jenny Bender. Jenny, if you could um, unmute and um, you'll have three minutes, uh, please state your name and where you live. Okay. Um, my name is Jenny Bender. I live in Northampton. I have two kids in the Northampton Public Schools and I'm a member of REAL, Racial Equity and Learning, a group of caregivers, students, teachers, and staff in the public schools working toward becoming an anti-racist district. Today, I'm sharing a statement that was written collectively by members of REAL. First, we want to acknowledge that the challenges of reopening are at the forefront of everyone's mind tonight. However, because school discipline is on the agenda and because of the current and rightful outrage about the need for racial justice, we feel compelled to speak on the issues of police presence and alternative forms of discipline in the Northampton schools. We are pleased to hear that as part of the budget cuts, the Northampton Police Department eliminated the district's school resource officer position, as we know there are much more effective and less harmful ways to deal with conflict in schools. It's also important to not acknowledge that, that this is not about one individual, but about what the data tells us about police in schools. Research across the country on the impact of SROs reveals shocking data. We will include more when we email this statement, but one example, a three-year study of 13 schools in a southeastern school district with both urban and suburban characteristics showed schools with SROs had nearly five times the number of arrests for disorderly conduct as schools without an SRO, even when controlling for the level of economic disadvantage of the school. And not surprisingly, the presence of SROs disproportionately harms targeted populations, namely students of color and students with disabilities. 
For example, 70% of students arrested at school are Black or Latinx. It is critical to note that data also shows that schools are no safer today than they were before the implementation of SRO programs. We know that North Hampton is not exempt from these statistics, no matter the rhetoric about our so-called progressive town. To illustrate, white students at the high school are the only racial group whose percentage of disciplinary action, 50%, is lower than their percentage of the population, 69.3%. Compare that to our black students who make up 2.8% of the population and account for 5.83% of disciplinary actions and our Latinx students who make up 17.17% of the population and account for 30.83% of disciplinary actions. The termination of the SRO position provides an opening for us to seek new and better possibilities for dealing with conflict in schools. There are two related projects that REAL will be working on in coordination with other local groups and community members. One, a commitment to sever all relationships between Northampton Public Schools and the Northampton P Police Department from here on out in the form of a school committee resolution. And two, a push for a truly authentic restorative justice approach in our schools. Here we would like to note that the newly revised code of conduct claims this is something the district is committed to. We hope that going forward, the district goes beyond making claims about anti-racist intent to actually following up with anti-racist actions and practices that, though they will require time and effort and a willingness to make and learn from mistakes, will ensure our schools are healthier places for all students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. The um, next person with their hand raised is Karen Hidalgo. Karen, if you can unmute yourself, please. Hi, I'm Karen Hidalgo. I am um, a resident of Ward 1. I live at 133 Barrett Street in Northampton. I have two children in the Northampton Public Schools, a daughter at JFK and a son at Jackson Street. I work as a high school counselor, also known as a guidance counselor at Northampton High School. I've worked here for a little over five years and I am here to talk about the staffing levels at the high school. In all my time at Northampton High School, there's always been a shortage of staff in math, art, and Spanish um, each year. Social studies is also beginning to look um, a little bit short as well. Last year, we had to tell about a dozen new registering students that they couldn't take Spanish because all the Spanish two classes were full at 30. This year, um, the year that's coming up, we're avoiding that um, by cutting a full section of Spanish culture and film so that students who requested that course um, may not be able to take it, but the students who are coming in who need Spanish too um, should be able to get in. Many of the classes um, in math at the high school are over 25. Um, they're often 28 to 30, and sometimes they're over 30. When school counselors are working with new students, um, we have trouble finding room in certain classes and departments. Math, Spanish, and art classes are often full. We need a full-time math teacher at the high school. Um, we need at least a part-time art teacher. We have an art teacher right now. We have 1.87 art teachers, and we could definitely use a, um, two full-time art teachers. And we have, um, we're hiring a part-time Spanish teacher um, because we have somebody leaving the district and we really could use a full-time Spanish teacher instead. We also have a need for a 504 coordinator. Um, the 504s and related paperwork have proliferated over the past years and are taking um, time away from counselors working with students on social emotional issues, academic counseling, college and career counseling. And that was the topic that I came to talk about, but as people are speaking, I just wanted to say, um, to add that I'm really glad to hear the interest in restorative justice and um, the anti-racist work happening in the district. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, the next person who has their hand raised is Jonathan Knapp. Jonathan, if you can um, unmute yourself and state your name and uh, where you live for the record. Hi, I'm Jonathan Knapp. I live at 312 Main Street in East Hampton. I teach English at Northampton High School and I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I just want to say thank you to um, the school committee members who got the discussion of uh, 
the school resource officer um, on the agenda for tonight. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to hear that. I um, was very happy to see that um, budgetary uh, decisions um, will not have an armed, mean that uh, we won't have an armed officer at the high school this year. And I hope that y'all will um, uh, make that a uh, Northampton Public Schools policy. Um, and I want to thank um, those of you who have written to me in support of uh, getting rid of the school resource officer. Um, those, uh, those have been um, very encouraging um, conversations. So I thank you for that. And um, I look forward to uh, that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. The next person who has signed up is Sharon Deal. Sharon, if you can uh, unmute yourself and state your name and address. Hi, my name is Sharon Deal. I live at 57 Baker Hill Road in Florence. I recently completed my 25th year as a special education teacher and eight years at JFK. Um, I look forward to seeing the plan you finalize and approve in order to keep our students, families, faculty, and staff safe and limit the spread of COVID. This plan will impact stakeholders' financial stability. More importantly though, I am sure you are thinking about the impact this plan will have on the health and safety of our community. For me, the long and short-term health and safety consequences of COVID far outweigh any other consequences particularly if the negative health and safety consequences lead to morbidity or mortality. These outcomes will not just be data points in a study. They will be the children of your community, families, friends, neighbors, and community members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, the next person who has their hand raised is Phil Alape. Hi, can you hear me, David? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm new in town from San Francisco. My daughter's enrolled at Northampton High and uh, I am in favor of uh, live sessions uh, within the guidance of whatever the state's recommending. I think. Uh, you know, the, the numbers that are coming out from Massachusetts show that it's been well contained here. And I think the kids should get together in school and, you know, the hybrid method where whatever it is every other day or every other week. And, and so you can space the kids out physically. I think that should be sufficient. So that's my my vote. And then uh, I'm glad that this discussion uh, has some element of the police situation in Northampton uh woven into it because we we've been uh flabbergasted at the what you know the the common phrase is police presence so here it is a sleepy little peaceful town and you can't drive at it out of your driveway and drive for 30 seconds without seeing a cop around here and we saw in the paper the other day there's something like 75 cops on the payroll in northampton you got captains and sergeants and lieutenants it seems ridiculous, and you know, particularly when in the context of comments from the the people who are working in the school system, <laughs> begging for a, a Spanish teacher, begging for the you know resources. In the meantime, I saw a van today, uh, Northampton Crime Scene Investigation Unit. So you know, these these rural states have state police and the state police can cover these towns, you don't need 75 cops in a town like Northampton, and you don't need them out patrolling Route 66 and watching stop signs and guarding you know, stoplights and so forth. There's, there are too many police here, that's my feeling. Save the money, get rid of half the police force here. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Mr. Lape. Um, the next person um, who's uh, signed up to speak is uh, July Seibecker. July, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, uh, my name is July Seibecker. 
Um, I live at 41 Indian Hill in Florence. I'm in Ward 6. Um, and I wanted to ask some questions and uh, make a couple of statements specifically about school return. In the fall, I have a rising sixth grader. Um, I have a child who goes to the Montessori School in Northampton. So I've had a chance to see how a, a couple of different ways it, it, it looked this past year. Um, uh, and I would like to hear here in this meeting a report about what has already been put in place. I'm assuming I will, um, but I want to urge the possibility of returning to school early, which probably isn't most people's first choice because it's hot, but you know, nobody's getting everything they want in this COVID-19 circumstance. And, you know, if it, the difference is kids complain about being hot and it's less hot if you're outdoors, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and you're under a tent, um, or um, a greater risk of actual illness, I, I would take that everybody's cranky because it's hot. Um, but the data continues to show that it's uh, much safer when done right to be outside. And so I, I would like We're um, having a hard time uh, hearing you, July. Okay, Your sound is coming out. I want to urge them to be used for. Okay. Um, what was the last thing everybody heard clearly? <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm in my phone on my in my car. In the end of your last <laughs> the end of your last sentence. You kind of came in and out a little bit, so you can just pick up from there. Okay. I would like to um, urge uh, the use of tents as classrooms for the purpose of actually conducting uh, classes outdoors for as long as possible. Yes, it'll be hot. Yes, it'll be cold. But what it won't be uh, is as dangerous as if kids are stuck inside a room all day, whether or not they're six feet apart. Um, and I would like to hear a report about the, uh, about the acquisition of tents um, related to that. Um, I also got my kids' progress report, and it was kind of startling to see all the subjects that haven't been able to even be touched that were supposed to be addressed in fifth grade curriculum. And I think we should assume the eventuality is that we will be going to remote learning. I would like to urge that we have a lot more preparation this time, but I'm very concerned about the fact that we have lost a third of this past year um, in terms of curriculum, and we're likely to year, lose more of next year. And so um, no matter how good remote learning winds up being, and I would strongly urge that it stops being a choice and that we catch up people who cannot um, uh, connect correctly individually rather than let everybody fall behind. Um, but I'd like to hear preparation for how we're going to make up as much as possible, given that we are going to need to be safe before we're going to need to be there. Um, and hey, you're at you're at time now, July. So, um, but, okay, thank you. And and um, I I thank didn't you. I didn't announce this at the beginning, but our our public comment is not interactive. We, we don't, we're not, um, we don't respond to questions. Um, there obviously will be a discussion um, of the school reopening uh, progress. And so um, perhaps some of those questions will be answered then, but we don't, this isn't a time that we can directly answer questions. Um, the next person who has their hand up is uh, Daniel Kennedy. Daniel, if you can unmute and um, state your name and address and I'll start the timer. Hi, my name is Dan Kennedy. I'm in Ward 4, 167 South Street. Um, I don't usually attend school committee meetings. I want to say that, but um, one of the things that I think is really important um, and that people have already started the conversation around is that we have a chance to speak about what our values are as a community. Um, when we talk about the allocation of resources, the Northampton Police Department budget was cut. <laughs> and there's a chance for the schools to ask for that money um, and to really invest in schools, right? We've already heard that things are underfunded. There are schools that are out of ADA compliance um, and there are children who are in wheelchairs that cannot access a bathroom without assistance. Um, these are major points where 
we have a chance to invest in those communities. So I really look forward to seeing people ask um, the important questions of what can we do with more resources, what will actually help, and what will make the Northampton public school system look like the values that we all hold. And I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Daniel. The next person whose hand is raised is Andrea Agito. Andrea? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'd like to start by thanking everyone that's been working so hard to prepare for reopening and recovery. I'd like to thank, say thank you to this committee for doing the hard work of hearing the concerns of staff and community members as you prepare to make a thoughtful decision. I would also like to thank everyone that is committed to continuing the discussions and actions around restorative justice and anti-racism in our schools. As we look to reopen some form of hybrid version will combine the interests of many parties and will provide some face-to-face -face interaction for all students. Learning is social and based on creating relationships with teachers and peers. In order to be as safe as possible during face-to-face -face interactions, we must make it a priority to expand outdoor spaces and follow CDC guidelines. PPE must be mandated for all as well as maintaining six feet social distancing, regardless of the new guidance from the state. The state is giving guidance to reopen the economy. We must remain strong to protect the health and well being of our students and staff. We understand that for some of our youngest students and students with special needs, wearing a mask may not be tolerable and there may be difficulty staying six feet apart. We can deal with that on a case by case basis once we have shared a shared understanding for all. Our scenarios should not change at all in a reaction to the recent state guidance. We also need to be flexible for students, families, and teachers who need to be completely remote, whether it's because they need to quarantine or because they or their family members are high risk. Pairing teachers who wanna be remote with students who need to be remote is very important. Adding PD and prep time to allow for extra collaboration and planning for take-home work or mirroring work remotely is critical. One of the biggest downfalls to the attempts at co-teaching was the lack of enough common planning time. We can't let that be the case now. We must provide teachers with enough time to work together and plan exceptional programs for both learning in person and remotely. While we are planning our reopening, we also need to focus on getting additional funding to make sure our district isn't sapped of critical programs that once they are gone, very rarely come back. Not filling vacant positions and outsourcing our classes should never be an option. If we need additional math classes to help our students, when, then we should be hiring additional math teachers, not paying to put patches on our programming needs. During reopening, our students need to be connecting to the classes in their schedule more than ever. They need electives and exploratory blocks in addition to the requirements that will keep them engaged and excited about their learning. Now more than ever, we need to be expanding our course offerings in all departments, not cutting them. During these difficult times and to help our students recover, we need more staff, not less. I pledge to work every day to advocate for additional funding for our schools, and I hope you will join me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, the next person whose hand is raised is Carl Mead. Carl? Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. My name is Carl Mead. I live at 58 Northeast Street in Amherst. I use he, him pronouns, and I am a teacher in the English department of Northampton High School. Back in April, you voted to approve a budget that maintained an eight teacher. English department at NHS. You argued that seven teachers serving the entire school was too few. And we as a department appreciated that you understand what we need in order to best serve our students. Around the end of this past year, our department chair, Sue Crago, let us know that she was resigning to take a job in another district. Of course, we were sad to lose a beloved colleague and a fi fixture of the school community but we all eagerly awaited the jobs posting so we could volunteer for the search committee to replace her. But the posting did not go up. 
Instead, we started hearing rumors about proposals to eliminate that eighth position again. And eventually, 11 days into the summer, in a letter to the entire NHS faculty, we were informed that our department would be reduced to seven. Last week, the English department wrote you another letter asking that you show your support for our department once again. Since then, we have fielded several questions about that letter. <clears throat> and there is one thing I would like to make clear. Everything we wrote in that letter was based on information provided by school officials. We hope that after this meeting and after everything is said and done, that we will be able to work together to find an English teacher who can fill some of the enormous void left in our department. Lastly, I would like to emphasize what Superintendent Provost told the NHS faculty a few weeks ago. He said that we will need more teachers in schools with this pandemic, not fewer. I hope you'll take that guidance to heart and act accordingly. Thank you for listening. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much. The next person whose hand is raised is Willa Sippel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Willa. Awesome, thank you. Um, my name is Willa Sippel. I use she, her pronouns. I live in Florence, Massachusetts. And I just graduated from Northampton High School, which is very exciting. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking here today for two reasons. One is to ex express my full support of removing school resource officers from schools. I believe they have no place being in any school district whatsoever, and they fuel the school to prison pipeline. Um, and personally, I have never felt safer because we've had an armed police officer in our school, and I've heard that reiterated by many of my peers. Um, so I, I'm glad that this opportunity came up for them to no longer be in the schools, but I also want to pass a resolution to make sure that that is a permanent decision by um, the Northampton School District. Um, the second thing I'm talking about, I want to echo what Mr. Mead mentioned. Um, I recently heard a rumor that that the school is thinking or was going to eliminate uh, the position of a English teacher. Um, frankly, I'm I'm really disappointed by that because I it was a, kind of a triumph when we found out that that had been shut down earlier this year. And I've been in English classes that have been way over capacity and teachers are more focused on controlling the classes than they actually are on teaching because that's how you have to manage it. And that's not on teachers at all. It's when you have, oops, it's when you have way too many students in a classroom packed in like sardines. So I want to Again, we need more students, uh, more teachers, not less right now. And I really, really oppose cutting a position of an English teacher because Craigo is leaving. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you, Willa. The next person whose hand is raised uh, have the first name Liz. Liz, you can unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Liz Bowen. I live in Florence in Ward 1. Um, I am a parent of a rising first grader at Leeds and I will be teaching second grade at Leeds in the fall. And I just wanted to speak to the idea because, and that not to single out the commenter who said it earlier because it's not the first time I've heard it. The idea that it working in a hundred degree heat is a mere inconvenience or being slightly discomforted. Um, I've had situations um, at Leeds where I've had to send kids to the nurse because they became sick from how hot it was in my classroom. And that's with school starting in September. And that sounds dramatic, but I'm not like, I'm not sending kids to the nurse for fun. I felt very ill from, and had to be extremely strategic in my classroom about how unbearably hot it gets. We don't ask anyone except kids and teachers to work indoors under these conditions. And I just like, if kids get sick from heat stroke and you have to send them to the nurse, like that is compounding their potential exposure to illness to an extent that probably mitigates any benefit of starting earlier. If there is no plans to include air conditioning or any type of temperature control in the buildings, I would urge the school committee to be very, very careful about deciding to 
start the school year earlier, heat is not just an inconvenience. Heat can be dangerous. And there's a giant Harvard study in 2018 that showed that when temperatures are above 90 degrees in a working space, it negatively impacts student learning for as much as almost 1% for each degree. And of course that um, negative impact is more pronounced in kids who come from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. This isn't just an inconvenience thing. This really, if you look at that study, the extent of it is really profound. And we need to be thinking about all of the kids and not just the people who talk at school committee. And so I would really just urge that when we're talking about the conditions that we're working and learning in in the schools that we're not only thinking of COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liz. The next uh, person with their hand raised is Michelle Sullivan. Michelle, you can uh, unmute yourself. Hi, thank you, David. Um, so I will keep myself pretty brief. Um, I am an educator who lives in Ward 7B. Um, I'm an early educator who's been working in the Northampton area since the 90s. And my husband is a high school teacher in South Deerfield. I also have a daughter who will be a ninth grader um, in the fall. I just wanted to touch base on a few of the issues around reopening um, that a lot of other people have brought up, um, mostly Andrea Ajito, thank you. Um, basically, I feel really strongly that we need to prioritize best practice. Um, we know that we know some things about how this is spread and the um, guidelines that came out bumping social distancing down to three feet in classrooms. I feel that decision was made in the best interest of the economy, that it's not science-based. It's not based on what we know about how air droplets spread, even with mask use. I strongly, strongly urge that any in-person learning that goes on needs to happen in spaces where children and adults are spaced six feet apart from each other. We know it's not ideal for personal connection, but that's not what we're focusing on right now. Um, I also would like to voice my support for teaching in outdoor environments whenever it's possible. Um, I understand that it's not always possible. There are a lot of budgetary and logistical concerns in the way, but in terms of what we know about how this virus spreads, in terms of airflow and air quality, it's best practice. Um, I feel that in terms of children's mental health, and learning that a hybrid model splits the difference between those two. But I feel like we're dealing with a, a temporary problem that's here for, for now, that the consequences are very, very serious. COVID's not gonna be here for forever, but um, when it is here, we need to prioritize keeping children and families safe from it. Um, to that end, maintaining flexibility to allow teachers and students that need to work from home for their safety or the safety of their family needs to be part of our plan. We already have a fairly punitive attendance policy in the public school system, particularly for families that are medically complicated or dealing with disability. And I feel that we need to really readjust the way that we look at that in the, in the eyes of COVID. Um, one of the things that came up with in conversation with my husband today in terms of best practice in a COVID classroom and best practice in general when you're teaching is how interesting it is that better adult teacher ratios are something that we know have very positive outcomes for students in general. If you have smaller class sizes and you have good adult child ratios, whoops, <laughs> then it's better for Uh, good evening. Uh, this is the resumption of the uh, June 29th, 2020 uh, school committee meeting, Northampton School Committee meeting. We had a little power glitch there. The power went out. Several of us uh, got kicked off the call. 
Um, so I believe when we last left, um, we had another hand raised and that was Sherilyn Strader. Um, Sherilyn, if you wanna unmute yourself and um, state your name and uh, offer public comment. Thank you. Uh, it's been an interesting uh, break, uh, but glad I can speak. Uh, my name is Sherilyn Strader. I use she, her pronouns, and I live in Ward 6. Uh, I'd like to echo some of the sent sentiments of Andrea Egito, Carl Mead, Willis Sippel, and Michelle Sullivan, um, in that um, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing a resolution to permanently remove SROs from our school um, as a recent NHS grad from 2019. Um, I personally didn't understand the need for an armed officer in our schools. Um, and in these discussions tonight, I hope that um, we can think about what discipline means and why we uh, automatically think about punishing students versus um, thinking about uh, restorative justice. Um, and I'd also like to uh, say that I am disturbed by the idea of cutting a teacher from the English department. Um, again, as a recent grad, um, I personally know that Teachers don't, uh, in classrooms, don't have enough capacity. I have been in classrooms where we frankly didn't have enough chairs for every student. Um, and in one class, uh, we took turns who sat on the floor because uh, there just was one uh, chair that there just wasn't enough. Um, and like you, there were too many heads in the room to see the board. Um, and there's not enough airtime for everyone to be able to ask their questions. And if you have an IEP or a 504, like you just don't get enough det attention. Um, so um, I, it's just disturbing to think that the English department will have to have even larger class sizes. And it's just wrong for future students to have to endure that. Um, so I yield my time. Thank you. Okay, so um, there are no other hands raised. Is there anyone who's having technical difficulties um, raising their hand because you're on a phone um, or you're having issues doing it through um, your, your Zoom program? Um, if so, if you could unmute and just let me know that you wish to speak. Again, asking folks to either use the hand raise function or um, on a phone, I believe star six will allow you to raise your hand. Um, okay. So I'm not seeing anyone else who wishes to um, speak in public comment. So I will um, close the public comment period and we'll move on in the um, move on in the agenda. Now tonight's agenda, we have several announcements, and we have well, we have announcements, and then we have several uh, reports and recommendations. Um, followed by uh, it had been had been planned to be followed by an executive session. We're actually going to move into the executive session first um, to be able to um, take care of that. Um, uh, we hope very expeditiously, and then be able to come back out into the main meeting to um, to proceed with the meeting. So I'm going to ask, um, and school committee members will actually leave this Zoom meeting um, and go to a separate Zoom meeting for the executive session. So this Zoom meeting will stay um, and will continue to be here, and we will return to it. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we have a, a little glitch. If I leave this meeting as the host of the meeting, it will shut down the meeting. Okay. Um, I guess, but Dr. Provost and I didn't quite think that. I, it's okay. I have the, I have the other meeting open. It's actually open now. People can just go to that meeting, and I will give you the notes from the meeting. Okay. All right. I'll stay here. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So, but don't go yet because we actually have to take a vote. Um, so um, I would ask if um, if there would be a motion to um, uh, request the entry of executive session. 
someone would make that I'll motion. Move. Sure. Okay. So do you want me to read it? Yes, please. Uh, member okay. Um, I will, I'd like to make a motion to request to enter executive session under Massachusetts general law open meeting chapter 30 a section 21 a three to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Do you second that motion member Kaufman? Yes. Okay. So the motion is made by member Voss and seconded by member Kaufman. Um, I'll now ask the clerk to call the roll. Um, yes would be to move into um, the executive session. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narquit. Yes. Member Busanski. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. I'm not here, Member Levy. Um, I know she, maybe she didn't come back in. Um, Member Kaufman. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. Uh, the vote is nine because I don't believe Member Levy is back in. Okay, so the motion carries and the executive, uh, the executive session is approved. So the school committee will now exit this Zoom meeting um, and enter executive session. We will return to open session from the executive session. So we will, um, members can now leave this meeting and go into the executive session meeting.
three, two, one. Good evening. We are reconvening the June 29th, 2020th meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, we are um, reconvening an open session after having completed um, a duly uh, voted on executive session. Um, so we will now uh, pick up um, our agenda um, and we will go to um, announcements um, and uh, so are there any announcements from members of the school committee? If so, if you could um, raise your hand, Mem um, any, any announcements from members of the school committee? Member Kaufman. Thank you. Um, Dr. Provost, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but is I thought it would be a good idea. Can you give a very quick uh, summary of, or make a quick announcement regarding the JFK principal search and what if uh, any community members want to convey any questions to the candidate, what they need to do? Sure, thank you very much. The um, screening committee has identified one candidate. Um, he will be meeting with a number of different constituent groups over the course of the day on Wednesday. There's a meeting at 1.30 with administrators. There's a meeting uh, later in the day with faculty. And then there's a meeting in the evening for uh, parents and community members. So um, the parents of JFK have been notified via uh, email. The staff have been notified via email. And we do have an opportunity for people to ask questions to the candidate at both of both of those public sessions. There's a Google form on the district website, um, which people can use to submit questions. I will be going through the, the questions and, and finding the high frequency ones, um, probably combining a number of similar ones. Um, and um, the, the format will be, I will just ask questions from the list and the candidate will have an opportunity to reply. Um, and then, members of the faculty as well as parents who attend the open session will be invited to provide me some feedback on their impressions. Um, obviously this was the only candidate that was sent uh, up by the, the screening committee that, that speaks um, really highly of, of their impressions of him. I met with him on Friday and we had a, a very long and very good interview. So I'm just waiting to hear what the faculty and parents feel um, about him before making my final determination. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other announcements from members of the school committee? Um, Dr. Provost, I don't. I know that there's not a superintendent report. Did you? Was there some announcement you planned on making um, at this point in the meeting? I just. I just wanted to speak to many people who may be interested in um, what may be coming tomorrow as a result of that executive session. I know that there were um, that there are employees now who've been working under the assumption that our tentative agreement would be viewed favorably by the committee. Obviously the um, final vote won't take place until tomorrow, but I think based on the discussion that I was just a part of, I have every reason to believe that we'll have a successful ratification vote tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Provost. Um, any other announcements? Um, hearing none, um, we'll now move into uh, reports and recommendations and the first, um, uh, item is item A on the agenda, uh, which is um, an ongoing agenda item we've had on our last uh, several agendas and probably on a future uh, discussion and vote, um, school reopening models. And I'll turn now to um, Dr. Provost. Thank you. Um, Annie, I wonder if you would be able to share uh, the document that went to the members of the committee just so I'm happy to get, give me a minute to get it up. Okay. While you're doing that, I will also be opening it on my computer. Uh, 
Okay, and Annie, while you're while you're um, loading that onto the screen, I'll I'll just start talking. So let me begin by discussing what's not in the report. Notably, this report doesn't include a plan for in-person instruction for all students. This is a follow-up to our last school committee meeting at which you asked for more detail on three school reopening scenarios. Since that time, DESE has released its initial reopening guidance. DESE is also asking districts to prepare for three possibilities. One of those is all remote learning. That's what we envisioned as our scenario one. The state also asks us to prepare a hybrid learning scenario in which some instruction is delivered in person and some is delivered remotely. Both scenario two and five, which we'll be discussing tonight, would be considered hybrid learning models. However, the main thrust of DESE's reopening guidance focuses on in-person instruction. The phrase in-person instruction occurs 57 times in the reopening guidance, and more than half of those times it is to call districts to prioritize developing plans for in-person instruction or to discuss the benefits of in-person instruction over a hybrid model or fully remote. So I don't have a model of fully in-person instruction explicitly outlined tonight, but we can start um, discussing that in some detail based on the information that's included in the two hybrid scenarios. Um, the other thing is that this report doesn't discuss staffing patterns for any of the hybrid models. For the fully remote or fully in purse instruction, staffing patterns are straightforward, but either of the hybrid models will have many details to be worked out in terms of staffing patterns to support them. So that's a problem that we can move to once we've settled on a single hybrid model. So I think maybe at this point, we can just congratulate uh, the district leadership and the school committee. You anticipated two of the three options that would eventually be requested by the school committee, I mean, by the, by the state. And so um, I think we're well, very far ahead of the game because of that. So Annie, if you could move on to the next one. First, I'd like to talk about the survey results. Um, that also was a part of our discussion last week. Uh, one of the thing, or two weeks ago, one of the things the school committee wanted me to report on were attitudes of caregivers around their, their hopes for reopening. And we did have a, a survey that was open at the time. It has since closed. We ended with over, with about 650 responses. Um, so it's certainly not comprehensive of the entire universe of, of caregivers, but it is a very robust sample size for a district of 2,700 students. So before going into this, I wanna just thank Kathy Casal and Andy Kerner, as well as their UMass grad student, Zachary Santana, who, uh, were the ones who went through all of the, the qualitative responses and summarized these themes for us. So just going through the high level results, caregivers of both elementary and secondary students are very concerned about their students' lack of ac academic progress during the closure. I think we heard about some of that in public comment tonight. Caregivers of both elementary and secondary students are very concerned about their students' social and emotional well-being as a result of the closure pandemic. And I know that has been a theme that certainly has stood out to me as I've gotten parent responses to the different opening reopening models that are on the agenda tonight. Also, caregivers shared a number of obstacles uh, in being able to support their children's learning during closure. The most frequent responses that caregivers gave was the impossibility of juggling demands of working full time with homeschooling. Although this is really remote learning, I, I think a lot of parents experience this as a form of conscripted homeschooling. Supporting children's motivation to do school for elementary parents was difficult in shifting from playtime to work time being able to manage and prioritize time and tasks was a challenge. And there was confusion about the multiplicity of platforms being used within the district. Um, there were many online learning 
platforms that were being used because we had to um, start remote learning with very little time to um, to prepare. And so teachers were left in a position of having to sort of launch out on their own. And one of the results was that many of them chose their own learning platforms. And what we heard from a lot of parents was that they were trying to manage their children's ability to access three or more different learning platforms in the course of the day being used by different parents. Um, there is also not enough feedback on assignments, inconsistent messaging, vague instructions, or them being unsure if the child actually did the work. Caregivers also identified some district actions that might have been helpful, or I'm sorry, that, that have been helpful. Um, one was regular communication, updates, robocalls, and emails. The Chromebook technology was seen as a help by parents, and several individual teachers were given a shout out for their particular actions during the closure. I just heard of Okay, I just got a text message to speak louder from Annie, so I will do that. Sorry. Um, so moving on to the next slide, Annie. Is this, okay. this is yep. the next slide. That's right. That's right. So caregivers also gave us feedback about remote learning. They expressed disappointment and concerns with a number of things, including the reduced level of academic rigor provided during the closure, limited opportunities for synchronous learning during the closure, um, limited amount of feedback they, their child received on work that was completed, and confusion about different platforms as we discussed above. However, I also wanna point out that many caregivers thank teachers and the district for doing the best they could in an unprecedented and very challenging time. We had some suggestions for continued learning at both the elementary and the secondary level. And there were several uh, items that were characterized as being overwhelmingly representative of the, the responses from caregivers. And in that category included things such as caregivers wanting much more synchronous learning opportunities for their children, more Zooms, more required classes, more face-to-face -face interaction with teachers, with teachers and peers, and more feedback from teachers on student work. Essentially, caregivers want school to look and feel more like school. Also overwhelmingly, caregivers wanted deeper learning, higher expectations, and more academic rigor. Also in the overwhelmingly category, caregivers wanted more support and more consistency in platforms, schedules, routines, et cetera. And at the secondary level, there was a particular concern for more support for mathematics instruction. And caregivers wanted opportunities to be planned that allowed their children to have fun, relax social interaction with peers that is non-academic and in focus and content. And so any of you go on to the next page. When asked how their children feel about returning to school, about a third said their children were excited and happy, about a third said their children were worried, anxious, or afraid, and about a third said they were ambivalent, excited to see their friends, but worried about the virus. And so some concerns that, caregiver, that caregivers shared about returning to the fall were concerns that their child would get the virus and transmit the virus to vulnerable family members, concerns that their children would not follow safety protocols involving social distancing, hand washing, and mask wearing, that their children will continue to be socially isolated if we stay with remote-only instruction, that their children will continue to fall behind academically if we continue with only remote instruction, and that they will not be able to manage their children's school schedule and academic needs while also returning to work themselves. And so I need the last piece of the survey. So uh, we did have some results that were particular to transportation. As we discussed in the last meeting, transportation is a linchpin for all of the return to school models. 
seven percent overall said that they did not plan to send their child back to school until a vaccine is developed. That was the whole sample. Whether or not they they used the school provided transportation, eleven percent. And this is specific to people who do use the school transportation. Eleven percent of our current riders said they would discontinue school transportation. Three percent said they have not used school transportation before, but will need to do so now. So overall, we project a 7% decline in school attendance and a 15% decline in school ridership. And someone just texted me again. So I'm still asking for more volume. OK, I'm going to try to shout really loud. Sorry. OK, so. Going to scenario one, this is uh, substantially remote learning. Okay, just fuzzy sounding. Maybe I'm actually too close to the microphone. Maybe I won't yell, but just, <clears throat> okay. So this is our scenario where students stay substantially remote. It's one of the scenarios that the state has required of us. So with the emphasis on in-person learning being the top priority for reopening, we expect that any remote learning model will need to conform to a more stringent set of requirements, including things such as validated teacher contact time and attendance. Based on that, we believe a fully remote model re will require substantial additional investments in instructional hardware, software, and professional development. Our current one-to-one -one program covers students in grades three to 12. To prepare for a potential third stage of remote learning, we need about additional 600 additional Chromebooks at an estimated cost of $120,000. We're also recommending obtaining additional licenses to some new online learning, um, to, obtaining additional licenses to some platforms we currently use and obtaining additional platforms to some new online learning platforms. Specifically, we will need more licenses for A to Z, RAS Kids, and Lexia. The cost of these additional licenses would be about $40,000. Additionally, we are recommending two new online resources to support our math programs. Open up Kidum and Dreambox, which would cost $25,000 and $34,000, respectively. We think of these items totaling $219,000 as the fixed costs for a remote learning scenario. Where we may have some flexibility is in the professional development to support the remote learning. At the last meeting, I felt strong encouragement to expand professional development for remote learning. So I asked our tech team to put together a wish list for the best possible remote learning professional development. Most of the items could be taught by external or internal facilitators or a combination of both. But the real cost is staff time. It would take three to five days for a teacher to complete the full remote learning training being recommended. So the cost to the district could be as high as $350,000. Some of these costs could be offset by reductions that could be made if we move to a remote learning model or by new funds that may become available to assist with reopening. One of the things we've um, heard in our, our conference calls with the commissioner is that there is a, a new, there'll be new funds available to support reopening plans. And the, um, the range is up to 200, and $25 per student. So I have no idea what our increment will be or how much will be allowed on a per pupil basis, but that could potentially be a significant source of funding to support this. So um, moving on to just discuss the, discuss the remote learning. I can see you're there already, Annie, thank you. Um, so these are the sessions. Um, I'm not gonna read everything, but just to, to explain what the sessions are. Um, we'd like to do sessions on connections, which is uh, focused on building a sense of community during the shutdown. 
communicating through Class Dojo, which is one of the platforms that we will be supporting. Um, as we surveyed our staff, it seemed that Class Dojo was the primary platform being used for young children and Google Classroom was the primary platform being used for older children. So in our professional development plan, we are planning on only supporting those two models as a way of addressing the parent concern about too many different learning platforms being used in the district. Excess executive processing for the teacher, um, which is just a, a way to help teachers manage the reality we've all been living in with hundreds of emails on a daily basis, um, and executive processing for the students because they've been subjected to the same thing as well, especially since many of the learning platforms send students reminders about work due. Um, they've also they've also been challenged by excessive communication about work in the remote learning environment. Organizing your class, organizing your Google Classroom, again, as we said, that would be the platform we, we support for, for older students. Supporting reluctant learners, turning your materials digital, a flip it session on blended and flipped classrooms, which may be especially helpful if we go to a remote, uh, not only in a remote, fully remote session, but also in a hybrid um, scenario where students may be taking one or two days a week um, for remote instruction and the rest of the days being with person to person instruction, a flipped classroom model could, could work really well in that scenario. Entirely online, where do I start? Um, this, is, this is a session um, helping teachers kind of think about not what we had in the past, which is a scenario where we started in face to face and built relationships with students, but how do we do it if our class begins online and we don't know when we'll ever be able to meet the students? Continuing uh, getting off the screen, ways to implement learning that don't involve technology. Um, providing meaningful feedback, which is directly responsive to one of the results of the survey. Cross-curricular collaboration. Personalizing remote learning. Supporting the parent role in remote learning. And finally, non-teachers and supporting teachers and students in remote learning. So um, the total professional development time for this would be 20 to 30 hours. And as I mentioned, I think that's where a great deal of the cost would be associated, um, just paying staff for, for all that time. So that's scenario one. Moving on to scenario two, this is, this is the model where elementary students have face-to-face -face instruction and secondary students have remote. In this model, we're considering sixth grade to be part of elementary school. One of the things we did when the Department of Ed released its guidance is we looked at what we could do with different, with different distancing um, requirements. Um, we heard a lot tonight about three feet and six feet, but I think it's important for the committee and the community to realize that those are not um, the only options. There's a whole range of distances between six feet and three feet. And so we just took them at one foot increments. So the models were initially designed at six feet. If we remained at six feet, uh, the configuration would have to look like this. Bridge Street and Leeds would become pre-K to three. Jackson Street and Ryan Road would be K to three because they don't have preschools. JFK would have grades four and five, and the high school would have grade six. Seven and 12 would be remote as per the model. Some other adjustments is, are that the library would have to be used as classroom space at Leeds. And as I said, alternative staffing would be required. Um, that's going to be for all of these, so I'm not gonna keep saying it. But as I said, that's the next level of this problem. So if we go with this model, and you want me to develop it more, the next thing uh, I would expect you to ask me to, to come back with is how would you staff it? So if we go to five feet, then Bridge Street and Leeds could be pre-K to four, 
JFK would be grades five and six and the high school would be unused. Grades seven through 12 would remain remote. In this scenario, the base room at Bridge Street would have to be used as a class and the library and community room would have to be used as classes at Jackson Street and JFK. If we went to four foot spacing, Bridge Street and Leeds would be pre-K through five. Jackson Street and Rhine Road would be K through five. JFK would have grade six and the, old, and the high school would be unused. Grade seven through 12 would still be remote. The only adjustment required in at four feet is that the base classroom would still have to be used as a class. And so moving on to scenario five, this is a scenario that originally started as a four day rotation from elementary and a one day rotation for secondary. And as we, we John, we're losing your audio. Dr. Provost. I just sent him a message and told him that. Okay. Hopefully he'll, he'll get him back. Is his phone connection still there, Annie? Uh, hard for me to check from here. I see his screen connection. Um, he's he came in in a different way tonight. I don't think he's using his he phone. He said he's um he sent a message saying that he's going to call in. Okay. 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 So folks at home, we're just waiting for Dr. Provost to reconnect his audio connection through a different means. Um, Okay. Still waiting for him. There he is. Okay. I am I Dr. Provost, are you back with us? Can hear him very yeah. softly. Okay. I'm, I'm, back. I'm back. Sorry, sorry to the to the committee, to the committee and to the hundred and thirty callers. Callers call. John, I think you have to mute. Um, I think you need to mute your other um, device because we're getting an echo. Okay. I know you're a Yankee fan, but the Lou Gehrig thing doesn't work well. <laughs> well, I thought the other audio wasn't working, but. I guess it decided to work. Yes. Sure. All right. So uh, looking at scenario five, 
as I was saying. So this was a scenario that was originally a four-day rotation for elementary and a one-day rotation for secondary. And the, the feedback that we received from this was very uh, overwhelmingly in the direction of doing everything we could to create more face-to-face -face opportunities for students at the secondary level. So as we were working through this, we looked for um, ways to try to increase the amount of face-to-face -face contact time for secondary students, especially um, at once the, the state released its guidance and saw that we have some different opportunities we could provide. So any, if you could just advance this. So we'll start with the original model, which is six foot distancing. With a six foot social distance, Bridge Street and Leeds would be pre-K through four. Jackson Street and Ryan Road would be K to four. One of the adjustments that comes in right away in order to fit those students is we'd have to do half day kindergarten, um, which is permissible. Uh, it essentially doubles the amount of space you have available in the kindergarten classrooms. But it, it, comes, at a, it comes at a cost. Uh, there's so much, so much research on the benefits of full day kindergarten. It, it certainly isn't something that I would want to see happen. But as we think about the, the balancing of public health, educational outcomes, it's, it's something that would be in the mix at the six foot level. Um, Jackson Street, I'm sorry, JFK would be grades five and six. And then at high school, we would follow a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule with into three groups. So group A would meet on Monday, group B would meet on Wednesday, and group C would meet on Friday. Also, seventh and eighth would be meeting at the high school. They would be meeting at the high school on the, the seventh and eighth graders would be split into two groups, group A and group B, and group A would meet at the high school on Tuesday meet on Thursday. So at four, I'm sorry, at five feet, um, it's pre-K through four Bridge Street and K to four, I'm sorry, Bridge Street and Leeds, Jackson Street and Ryan Road without needing half-day kindergarten, could have full-day K. So base room would have to be used as a class at Bridge Street. Grades five and six would be housed. So the library and community room would be used as classrooms at Jackson Street and JFK. And we'd still be following that three-day schedule at um, three-day schedule for high school students and two-day schedule for, for the seventh and eighth graders. At the four foot level, things start to get, I think really significantly better in terms of in-person time. The four, at four feet, we could fit pre five at Bridge Street and Leeds and K to five at Jackson Street and Ryan Road. Those are the same grades they have now. Um, we would have to be flexible with space the base room would have to be used as a class. The community room would have to be used. The library would have to be used as a classroom at Jackson Street. Um, but then the, the we could offer and and, and sixth grade the, the schedule we could offer for students in grades six through twelve and becomes a little bit more um, ages. So sixth graders would still be going every day. But what, what could also happen is seventh and eighth could fit at JFK. You just could fit the entire seventh and eighth grade at, a, at, at when you had the sixth grade there at the same time. So you'd have to fit, you'd have to break the seventh and eighth grade into two groups. But the seventh and eighth grade group A could now get two days a week at JFK and the seventh and eighth grade Group B could also get at JFK, and Wednesday could be a day to provide additional instruction for at-risk learners from either Group A or Group B, or both Group A and Group B. Because 
none of this from JFK would need to go to the high school. That also creates more opportunities for students at the high school. And we're able to hold about 75% of the high school population at a four foot social distance. So what we're doing would be a, what, what's typically known as a waterfall schedule. Although um, in a waterfall schedule, you're usually rotating and dropping periods. Here we'd be rotating and dropping um, groups of students. So we'd split the high school into groups of four students and three of the four would meet every day. The group that was not meeting would be um, rotated. So just to give you an example of what a week might look like. On Monday, we could have group A, B, and C in the high school and D remote. On Tuesday, B, C, and D would be in the high school and A would be remote. On Wednesday, C, D, and A would be in the high school and B would be remote. On Thursday, D, A, and B would be at the high school and C would be remote. On Friday, you'd be back to your first three groups, A, B, and C with C remote. Next Monday, everything would be moved down one position. So you'd start the next week with B, C, and D in and one group remote. So as you can see with this, um, students at the high school would typically get three out of, I'm sorry, it you know, would typically get three or four days um, out of the week in the high school. So that um, that's an, sort of a tweak on scenario five that provides much more person-to-person -person instruction than we thought uh, would be possible previously. So that's that's what I have on on the new reopening scenarios, and I guess I should would just like to take a break now to to um, receive some guidance from the committee. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'll ask uh, committee members if they want to um, raise hands to ask questions. Member Kaufman, you have your hand raised. Yes. Um, did you mean community members or committee members? Um, You're asking point, me. Community, I believe he's referring to committee members. Yeah, I, I thought you said community members. I just want to clarify. We're just taking questions from committee, right? That's correct. We're we're um, yeah. we're in deliberation right now. Sure. So, Dr. Provost, I have just a few clarifying questions. Um, so, first of all, on on scenario two, can you hear me, Dr. Provost? Yes. Okay. So, on scenario two, I'm wondering. Um, I don't have it here in front of me, but you had for the four and five foot options you have the high school closed. And for the six foot option, you have grade six at JFK and at the high school, sorry. And I'm just wondering if we were gonna to go to the four or five foot options, would you be able to uh, fit in additional grade levels? For example, would grade levels seven and maybe even grade level eight be able to fit in uh, since the high school is not being used at all under two of those four and five foot? We definitely could fit in, yes, we definitely could fit in more um, more classes under those scenarios. The reason I didn't put those in the model is that this, this scenario specifically said that seven through 12 would remain remote. And also scenario five looks at, it essentially starts with the same um, configurations of students. So if you wanted to know what they could look like, what, for example, you could use the unused high school for in this scenario, you just look at scenario five and see where we could place the classes. Okay, so I mean, just I don't know where where we're going to end up tonight if we if we haven't narrowed it down to one. And I do appreciate the fact when we do ultimately narrow it down to one, you'll be able to really dig even further into some of the unanswered questions. But I don't, I I, I would not anticipate that anybody would have any objection to fitting in more students under a very safe scenario and. Scenario two, if the high school is closed, I think that may be adding uh, to scenario two what it would look like for additional students to come to school every day uh, at the high school at a four foot, four or five foot um, distance might be helpful for us. So I guess what I'm saying is you, you actually see that when you look at scenario five, 
Yeah, I'm just having a hard time because did you you took it down, Annie? So you want me to bring it back up? Yeah. Annie, is it preferable for us or John is uh, Dr. No, I'm Pope, happy to. How's that? Can you see it now? Are you looking at scenario two? So I, I think Annie, actually, if you go to scenario five. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay. so what you see here is essentially what we would still do under scenario two to fit in additional classes if um, that was the desire. Because um, basically at, at five feet or even at six feet, you, you can see what we could do with the high school. We could, we could bring students in at the same, um, in the same ways, except um, I'm sorry, not at the six foot level, because at the six foot level, we do have uh, sixth graders at the high school, but at the five and four feet level, it would be basically the same scenario because at that level, um, all of the fifth and sixth graders are at JFK. Where, yeah, but the difference, if I understand it right, is the seventh and eighth graders, which I'm trying to put into scenario two, the current scenario two has pre-K through six going to school in person every day, doesn't it? Both of them do. Right, but the scenario two does not have seventh and eighth graders going to school at all, I believe, right? That's correct. So I'm just wondering, I, I'm not getting your, I'm not getting the scenario that would be the same. If we wanted to add two more grades to scenario two, or at least one more grade, so it goes pre-K to seven, couldn't we do that? Um, so they come to, I guess the difference is, couldn't they come to school every day if they use the high school? So, and- As opposed to every other day or, um, yeah. So if you, if you went to scenario two, the, I guess what I was saying is if you want all students to get some some face-to-face -face time, the, the way to do it would be by, layering on the scenario five um, configurations onto scenario two, because right. in both of those, you're having the, the one to six go every day. So if you wanted to make two different than what you see in scenario five, what, what you would say is we don't want necessarily every grade to go, but maybe just, in, just increase to grade eight or, or whatever you, you would like to direct. What scenario five already does is it tries to get as much time as possible for seventh through 12th graders while the, the grades K through six are attending school every day. Okay, so I understand that. I think that that's what, what's in five. I think I was just trying to present two as a very much a different option. And so in scenario two, um, right now it's every day for uh, pre-K through six with total remote for seven through 12. And I'm just wondering in that scenario too, if you can look into making it every day for pre-K through eight and remote just for high school kids. Okay. And the, do you understand? So the way you would do that is by opening up the high school at the four and five foot level. And I do appreciate yep. you saying you can combine two and five to get another scenario, but just for just for our discussion about distinct scenarios, that just would be helpful if they fit. But it struck me as a not using a not using a complete school at four and five feet um, is not taking the best opportunity we can to have even more kids come every day. Yes, um, they they definitely you, we definitely could do that. There are approximately four hundred and fifty students in grades seven and eight. So if you went even to the Five foot level, you could you could probably put seventh and eighth at the high school. Right, um, I do think that might make a difference for some people, but I but I'm just okay. Thank you. My another question, and hopefully this won't be as long. <laughs> um, in the scenarios that we're referring to, is there an opportunity to take adult space? And I'm thinking of like department offices or um, staff offices, maybe even main offices, spaces that adults might be too close together and move those over to other unused 
shared space uh, within the school buildings. So when we were uh, building this out, we were actually looking at the blueprints. What we have is a is a situation where most all of the um, standard classrooms are already being used as classrooms, and the additional spaces that we have for faculty rooms or offices are already much smaller than classrooms. Yeah. So they don't really buy us anything. Where we do have the opportunity to create some more space inside the building is um, is in the libraries and the community room at um, at JFK. Yeah, I think just there, there to is clarify, I, 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 I'm, a little, I'm reluctant to use the cafeteria because it just is not an optimal place for learning. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm um, Dr. Provost, I don't think that's what I'm asking. Let me clarify, please. Um, I'm talking about helping adults not get near each other. That certainly is the, um, that's a concern that's not gonna go away. So I'm wondering if staff that are now in spaces that are too close together can use for example, the library or the gymnasium or somewhere where we can alleviate some of the concern of the adults in the building. When I worked in schools, for example, and I'm pretty sure we still have this, you know, there's the department space, the English department, math department, et cetera, are in a, you know, a, a shared space that probably would not be conducive to people feeling comfortable. And I'm wondering, can adults be moved and or have the option of working in much larger areas? Or I think that is, I think that is something the cafeterias could be useful for, because yeah. um, they're they're not going to be used for serving lunch, and they're not, I, I don't think appropriate to have students in all day long. Yeah. But they might be more appropriate um, spaces for staff to be able to go to for their breaks and for um, some of their workspaces outside of the classroom. Okay. And I have a couple more questions. I'm going to pass, except one final quick question. Um, when would PD be offered in the scenarios that you presented to us um, about professional development? Was this a, over the summer or was this spread out over a longer period of time? It would, as we envisioned it, it would be over the summer so that we were ready to go if we were starting in a remote learning scenario or if we had, so that we'd be ready if we had to switch over to a remote learning scenario. That's where most of the cost of the PD comes in because we would have to pay staff for that time. Okay. Theoretically, though, if it was too much or we couldn't get enough teachers to have the available time to do so, some of it could be switched um, until after the school year starts. Is that possible? Well, as you know, we don't have a lot of professional development time in the calendar, so that would be challenging because um, I, I believe. I believe when school starts, we're going to have, um, we're going to need all hands on deck. Um, I, I have heard that there may be some relaxation of the 180 day mandate for the upcoming year in order to provide some more time for professional development. If that happens, we could use some of that additional time, um, but that's not set in stone yet. Okay. Well, um... Thank you, Dr. Provost. All my colleagues have their hands up, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, pass, pass the baton. Thank you. Member Serafi Cox. Thank you. Um, I am happy to see um, some specific plans about, um, about professional development, uh, you know, to, to support our educators uh, in terms of the remote learning platforms. Um, I'm also um, happy to see that that a, ro a more robu robust platform for you know for learning is is being thought through here uh, sorry uh, a more robust plan for remote learning is being thought through here um, there uh, were some questions about uh, what platforms we were going to use and like going down to to one like a more um, comprehensive platform, um, meaning I don't know, something like Moodle, something like that. So that's one question. I'm just going to say all my questions and then you can kind of answer them all together. Um, 
I would also like to have more information on how we are going to determine if it's actually safe to return in person. Um, we're all seeing the, the headlines from across the country of, uh, of states who have reopened too quickly. Uh, and so uh, I, I just would like to, to know how we are making this as a, as a information-based decision rather than, um, rather than a, a decision based on, on guidance from, from politicians in Boston. Um, I'm, I'm quite confused about the, uh, the three feet guideline from the state. Um, the six feet guidelines is what the CDC recommends. It is the communication that has come in from every corner of our lives. Uh, now we stand six feet apart in, in every public place that we're going. So I can imagine that students will be very, very confused if they go to school and are told that three feet is okay. And then they go to Applebee's and they're told, no, three feet is not okay. So I, I just want to kind of, for us to think about that a bit. Also, um, I imagine that if we give the uh, guidance of six feet, that that six feet is only going to get smaller. So six feet might end up in practice being fewer than six feet. So if then the guidance is three feet, that's going to end up being fewer than three feet, uh, just in practice, knowing the way that young people are. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts, Superintendent, on the idea of starting early. Um, I know that the the colleges are um, are are doing this, and uh, and I know that we don't have as much air conditioning as they do. So I'm I'm cognizant of of those uh, concerns as well. Um, so my main questions that I would like to hear back from you on are about a, a more robust platform, how we're going to determine if it's safe how, I don't know, you don't need to respond to the six feet thing. I just said my piece about that. And then your thoughts uh, on starting early. Okay. So with respect to the, the learning platform, I, I do think that the two that we're narrowing in on will be well supported by the faculty and by our community. Um, we arrived at, at this level by asking staff what, what they've been using and they've been finding effective. And it originally we had hoped to just have one, one platform, um, but we found that there was a really strong divide between students working with very young students up and up to grade two, and then students who were working, uh, I mean, the staff were working with older students. And it split down, it split um, really strongly into Classroom Dojo and Google Classroom. I would say more than 90% of the staff fell into one of those two camps, which is really an amazing amount of agreement um, for this faculty on any issue that I've ever worked on them with. So I think that that's, that's a strong place to start from and I wanna honor that. Um, I, think, I think of Moodle as something that is, certainly I've had more experience with it in the adult ed realm than in K to 12. I know it can be used also with high school students, but I it would be a new platform for our, our staff to learn and one that is being used by almost nobody now. So I, I just think that's adding another level of complication. And as I understood the, the feedback from the parents, it was really not that they disliked any of the platforms or felt they weren't um, strong enough to, to carry the instruction. It, what they found confusing was the, the sheer number of them in use in the district. So I think if we can get to um, uh, a smaller number will be will be making some progress. Um, with respect to the three feet, I mean, I put six, five, and four deliberately out there because I, I think there's a range and, and there's a balance point that, that has to be met somewhere in the community. And, and so just showing you what can be uh, obtained at, at the different levels is, is what I have for you right now. Um, in terms of starting early, I, um, Initially, when I heard that, I, I, I think I, that, that um, suggestion came in an email from a parent, and I thought that it was really, um, I thought it was a good idea. And then someone reminded me of the experience that we had 
uh, two years ago when there was a heat wave in September. And there was an incredible outcry uh, but by, from faculty and staff, as well as parents, um, about the um, about how how inhumane it was to have students in school with those conditions. And so, starting early, I think, just means increasing the uh, increasing the the probability that that's going to happen, and then having us faced with a choice of do we start canceling all the days that we have scheduled early because it's now too hot for kids to be in school. Um, while well on this topic, I would like to address the issue of windows because I saw it come up in um, some of the in the chat. There is a problem with windows at JFK, and what we've told the facilities team is every classroom needs to have a working window, or else it needs to be taken offline. So, in our um, in our planning for the space at JFK, we haven't completely um, gone out to 100% of classrooms because we think we will lose some classrooms just to not having functioning windows. Um, so that adds another, um, another element to my thinking about starting early. Okay, Member Voss, you have your hand up next. Thank you. I, I, I'm trying to put my questions in two themes. So I think I'll ask the first theme first and get some answers and then the second theme second. And my two themes are safety and my second theme is gonna be the scenarios and how we get equitable classroom teacher time for all grades. So let me start with safety questions. Um, I've communicated some with the superintendent. I've heard from many, many community members. I appreciate all the incredibly hard work everybody's putting into this um, on all of the various teams. I, I, so what I say, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of anyone. I know we're all trying to do what's best for us collectively. But I do want to say, as a scientist, reading the DESE report on Thursday was really concerning to me. I want to get kids back to school. I know we all do. I know parents are worried about how they're going to work. But this report came across to me as something where we were not I, d I did not feel like it was portraying safety as high as it should. And things that really stood out to me were research that was reviewed in terms of how kids don't spread this disease as much as adults. Um, and there's a lot of research that suggests that, and they cited a lot of it, but they didn't cite other things. And in science, when you cite certain sides and not other sides, it's called cherry picking. And I'm just concerned that they didn't say, okay, well, there's these other things that go on. Um, let's tell the public why they're less important, such and I'm not going to go into great detail. It's just when you see that kind of thing, it's a concern. And that leads me to the six feet versus five feet versus four feet. Everything we're hearing is six feet. Everything we're hearing is this virus spreads when you breathe and cough close to somebody. And I want to really encourage us to not plan for anything less than six feet. Um, at a higher ed level, we're planning for more than six feet. And it's not because we have extra space. There's a lot of a lot of sacrifices being made. FEMA, FEMA guidelines are telling us to plan for much more than six feet. So I want us to stick with the six feet and not um, go into planning for less feet. We need to keep everyone safe. If the virus changes and in November or December things look different, sure, let's move the um, distance down. But right now I really encourage us to be more of a cautionary principle and plan for six feet. And I don't know, um, Dr. Provost, if you've had a chance, but I'm curious, I guess it's my first health question is, have we talked to our leadership in our Northampton Department of Health about four versus five versus six feet? How do people outside of the educational, the public educational field feel about this? That's my first safety question. Thank you. And um, I'm, I'm I'm really glad you asked that because it makes me think that I didn't answer one of member Seraphy Cox's questions. So let me go back um, on that. Actually, I, I guess it's a question or an answer to both of you. Um, so yeah, so you've seen the reopening teams. One of our reopening teams is the pandemic response team. It includes the city's health director and our school physician. I have reviewed the plans with uh, the city's health director and her, her, her response is that she doesn't see anything in here that um, goes 
against her recommendations as the chief public health official for the city of Northampton. She does say that as much as you can space, the better. Um, but there's there's nothing with the six or the five fourths um, that I've discussed here that um, raises red flags for her. Um, of course, we didn't talk about the three at some point. You know, I think the state is going to have us um, it, look at the three because one of the one of the directives we know is coming to us is a plan to get all students into school. And I, as, as you see that um, it's not possible at five feet or four feet, the only way that we'll be able to provide the third scenario for the state is if we think about three feet. Um, and that, so that three foot number is a number that isn't, uh, isn't, uh, hasn't been discussed with our local health officials. So that's the one I can't talk to you about yet. But um, when we get ready to make that report to the state, we will, certainly vet that through the health department and through our school physician as well. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to say for the record, I'm really uncomfortable with that. If you put kids four or five feet apart, teachers have to walk in between them. Um, I, I really think we have to plan for six or even that seems minimal. And I'll just say that now, if the virus changes in a few months, obviously we can be flexible and we should be, but I think we should start with a plan. And if the state wants all the kids back, we're going to have to do it on partial kids back at a certain time, um, staggering groups, and we're going to have to have more funding because it's not where I am absolutely against sending everybody back if it's not safe, or, safe enough to. Um, continuing on that theme, um, Distance apart is important, and we've talked about this before. Um, the other things are the amount of time that you're exposed and the air handling systems. How is the air flowing? So I'm curious to know if we have any updates on how the air flow, and I don't mean just one open window, but do we have a plan or have we already made measurements in classrooms to ensure that the air is recirculating completely, at least say, I think the number I read old buildings twice an hour, complete overhaul. I don't know for sure that's the right number, um, but um, what is our plan for making sure we're circulating air? Yes, so thank you for that. Um, and that that also came to us in a question from the public. Um, after receiving that email, I began working with central services on uh, strategy for obtaining a study of airflow within the building. Where we've landed is that the appropriate party to do that is a commissioning agent. A commissioning agent is a third party that the district would be using anytime it does an MFBA project that involves HVAC. Um, so it, it basically is just someone who's certified by the state to look at the work done by the vendors who install the HVAC system to make sure that adequate ventilation is being provided. So uh, we do have a couple of commissioning agents that we're in discussions with to do a study of the airflow within our buildings. And um, I'm, I'm looking at the, the information that was put out by the, the study from the Harvard uh, School of Public Health that um, I saw this weekend, I think probably you saw this weekend as well, um, as, as kind of a good baseline, just to see where we stand up or, or how we stack up to that measure. Okay, thank you. And, and um, Dr. Provost and I did email about the study. We both came across it. There was a study for people in the public and others out there. There was a study published on Friday from the Harvard School of Public Health about really a guide. And I think it's a, it's a much more cautious guide and it has a lot more details in it of what districts might do to get kids back to school. And I highly recommend it. Um, and then just the final thing in terms of safety um, could you just give us an update? Last meeting, you said you would look into potentially putting tents up. Um, I think we've received a lot more emails, a lot of ideas from a range of people about how students could use that as a place to connect in person. Teachers could use it as a place to perhaps move a lot of their work outdoors where especially teachers who feel like for whatever reason, it's not safe for them to be in a classroom could potentially spend more one-on-one -on -one or, or small group time with their students. Are we still looking into these tents? Um, and where does that stand? 
Yes, we're in discussions with several vendors on tents. Uh, I think that we'll we'll have a good outcome there. Um, we are a little bit um, at a loss for options with Bridge Street School because they're completely surrounded by pavement, um, with the exception of Lampern Park, which we don't um, control. Uh, I'm thinking of those tents as potentially good spaces to do some of the activities that have been um, specifically cited in the, the studies as dangerous for indoor, like um, any kind of woodwind, any kind of um, brass instrument, choral music, um, those, those types of uh, activities where students are sort of engaged in deliberately spreading their voices and their sound as, as widely as possible, um, which I think are really a high priority to get outside but other, other classes as well. Thank I And um, I, I'll just add, I think, I don't know if we can get access to the fairgrounds or the Sheldon Field that I know it's not right next door to Bridge Street School, but thinking a little bit about what's around there and see if we could um, get permission for that, if it made sense to the, to the school leaders there. Um, Okay, and I guess a transition for me for a few questions on the various scenarios is just to summarize safety and say they really are related to scenarios because I, I still, um, I, I know we're working on this, figuring out how many students are gonna be in um, remote no matter what and how many teachers and what that looks like. And it seems like we have quite a bit of work to do to figure out how to make that happen. Since our last meeting, I, I know many of us have had just numerous conversations and emails and I've really become convinced. I've actually talked to a lot of students too. Um, and not everybody's gonna agree with this. Every, some people are gonna feel really differently. And, and I think we just have to respect different perspectives. But what I'm hearing pretty loud and clear and I, I agree with, and you all know I'm not one to agree if I don't actually agree, um, is that all of our students need time with their peers and with their teachers. And um, whether that happens under a tent or in a classroom might have to do a little bit with grade levels and discussing what works for the group of people. But I think for me, the scenario two really doesn't work even though I expressed interest in it last time. Um, this idea of putting young kids in the high school, paying for the cost of getting various furniture there. Um, I don't think there's really enough teachers to accommodate that, but more importantly, seventh kids in seventh to 12th grade need equitable access. And um, I have talked to Dr. Provost about this too. I, I really think we need to come up with a plan where kids are having access to school at similar rates, no matter what grade they are in, whether it's everybody gets roughly 25%, maybe transitioning to 50% if they want it. Um, as the year goes on. And for that reason, scenario five still doesn't really work very well for me either. And I, I hope we can explore some of the other, some combination of the other scenarios um, where we can give all of our students um, that access. And at the same time, we have to figure out ways where teachers who can't safely teach can work remotely with their students. And somebody said this in public comment today, this is a horrible virus and we're all really rushing to get back to school or many of us are, but it's very likely in eight to 12 months, things are gonna change a lot. And so if we're safe and careful and do our best for the next six or so months um, and are in it for the long run, I think we need to really look out for each other as best as possible. And um, Anyway, so I guess my question as I leave is, are we considering some other scenarios to get those older students more FaceTime or um, where do we stand on that? So the other, the other scenarios were rejected by the school committee at the last meeting. If you want me to go back to any of those, or if the committee wants me to go back to any of those, um, they certainly can direct me to do that tonight. Um, I do think that scenario five addresses the concern about getting older students equitable face time um, better than, than any of the other scenarios. They're at least equitable to each other. And um, for the high school in particular, it's, it's very close. It's just a difference of one day a week. Um, 
it's the seventh and eighth that are a little bit um, a little bit disadvantaged by scenario number five, and I haven't been able to think of a way to tweak that. But the other option is to see if we can make that a little bit more equitable. And, and, and let me just be clear. I, when I say equitable, I don't mean exactly the same amount of time, but for me, both two and five are really different experiences. And um, I think it needs to be tweaked quite a bit. And just so my colleagues know, I have emailed after the last meeting. I, I don't think it was, these things were rejected. We were presented with 10 scenarios at the last meeting and asked to digest an enormous amount of information and, and were asked for feedback. But I really hope that the conversation is still open and we listen to our community and what people want because there is no right answer and things are changing. Um, so I, I hope this isn't off the table. I certainly know I've communicated over the last two weeks quite a bit with you about this one issue. So thank you. Member Levy, you're the next uh, member with your hand up. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll share at the, off, at the onset that Member Ross just, just articulated a lot of what I was also going to say. So I will say it a little bit more briefly just to, just to share my perspective. And then I do have a few questions. I do very sincerely want to thank everybody who's been working on this, these scenarios and, um, and uh, thinking, thinking about how to make this work um, for their dedication and their time. This is as folks have already said, incredibly challenging. And I appreciate the, the hard work that's going into this. Um, I, uh, I agree with Member Voss. I am in the same boat that um, I was more a fan of, of um, scenario five in our last meeting. And since then have heard from so many community members and really thought more about the, the real need for face-to-face -face time for our middle and high school students. And so I also reached out to you, um, uh, Superintendent Provost, to ask if there was a way to get more of that face time. And I was actually a, a little more hopeful that there would be more tweaks to Scenario 5 to get more um, face time for our older students um, than what we ended up seeing. And I guess what I would hope for is as we move, as we go back and as we move forward, I would say that we do look at some of those other scenarios and that we also look at how do we get our middle and high school students more face-to-face -face time without them being at three to four feet. Um, I, I will actually share something a little bit contrary to what some of my colleagues have said. And that is that I do very much um, I have also been looking at a lot of data and a lot of science and um, the data on younger kids and the rates of transmission is to me very compelling um, or lack thereof, the lack of transmission rates um, to, to make me think that if we do need to think creatively, perhaps what we could do is, is look at um, maybe some four foot regulations for our pre-K through second or pre-K through third graders with six foot for some of the older students. It's not clear to me in the data where the age range is, where that, um, that transmission rate begins to shift. And maybe that's something that we could learn more about. I will also share that the information about the, the more um, scary um, uh, and, and some, so some of those more scary um, symptoms for younger kids are, are very, very, very rare, and they're, they've actually almost ceased now that medical um, practitioners have been on the lookout for them and catching them much earlier. So, um, so having the younger students be a little bit closer in my mind could be still a safe way to try and get more of our students having face-to-face -face time. Um, I'll, sh I'll echo Member Voss's um, uh, desires for tents, um, and for us to really think creatively I would love to see us not just think about, well, how have we done school in the past and what needs to go outside in order for it to be safe, but how could we do school better? How could we do it differently, more creatively um, that engages students? One of our community members wrote about having um, advisory groups or smaller groups of students with a teacher where they're not just doing social emotional check-ins, but where they're also um, helping students with, with any, um, any trouble they're having or just questions they have academically and having those students connecting daily outside 
um, under tents to help with, with harsher weather conditions, I think would be um, something that I would love to see us thinking about. I also echo Member Voss's um, suggestion that we work with the city to try and put those tents, if there's not space on school grounds, in spaces that are, are close enough by to be safe and viable options for our students. Um, I think that there are schools that, that teach outside year round, um, just down the street from us. And there are lessons that we could learn. Clearly there would be some, some professional development that we would need in order for that to be effective. But I think it's something for us to think about. And, and in these scenarios, I guess I, I hope that, I know that in these scenarios, we haven't gotten to the how would the education be delivered and, and that that would be the next question, but I hope we can be really creative in that thinking and maybe some of that creative thinking can get us to being able to bring more face-to-face -face time for all of our students. I also agree with Member Voss that equity does not equal equality. And I don't necessarily think, I, I do think that our, our youngest students will have a lot of trouble doing remote learning and I do still think that that having them um, have more face-to-face -face time is um, is okay as long as our middle schoolers and high schoolers are getting what they need developmentally. Um, I'm going to get to questions soon, I promise. Um, going over my notes, and again, a lot of this has been asked. Um, I, uh, I I guess I will say. Um, that some of my questions may not be appropriate because the, I think it's getting ahead of our, uh, ourselves. I do really have questions about who are gonna be our teachers. Um, and I hear you that you're not ready to answer that question, but it's hard for me to say yes to a scenario where, um, where it's really hard to know um, who, how are we gonna be preparing the people who are gonna be leading our students to do so? How are we gonna ensure that our students um, who have, um, have, have various learning needs uh, are gonna be supported, um, especially if what was, what was um, offered last time around when we had this conversation was that co-teachers would, would take their own classes. Um, what does that mean for the support of our students, um, of all of our students? Um, and so it's hard, again, it's hard for me to understand how these scenarios would work without knowing who those teachers would be and then I will, I'm gonna put a little plug in this is getting ahead of myself. Um, again, thinking creatively, we have something on our agenda that is gonna bring us to a conversation um, in just a moment or just a moment, probably in a few hours on, um, on the potential for restorative justice in our district. And this came up from numerous folks talking um, in the public comment period. And I would like to share that restorative justice and restorative practices are not just about discipline, they're also, they're also about forming community. Um, and there are a lot of really great opportunities for our students to engage in restorative practices to build community remotely. And that that is something that I would really love to see us thinking about um, for our remote learning plans so that our remote learning is both thinking about the academic, academic needs and the social emotional needs. Um, restorative practices could be a really, really useful tool to be able to build community amongst our students when they are learning remotely. Um, so I guess I just said a whole lot of stuff without really asking questions. Maybe you can get some questions out of what I said. Um, I will end by saying I agree with Member Voss that to me, option two is really not viable. And um, I think option five is only viable if we can increase face-to-face -face time for our middle school and high school students without there being at three three feet or four feet. Um, and I would love to see us reconsider some of those other options that, that get us back to more face-to-face -face time. Uh, and again, thinking creatively and not just about how school has been, but how school might be. Dr. So, Prowlers, do you wanna to respond to her? Sure. Um, I guess the, the one thing we haven't discussed um, and this may be a place to get some direction from the committee, is whether you want me to really explore the time dimension. Because the, the spacing and the desire to get more face-to-face -face contact for students fight against each other. The, the more spacing you provide, the less students you can fit, so the less, um, the less 
face-to-face -face contact you can have. But we've done all this assuming that we need to keep the day within sort of reasonable parameters to what they are now. In, an, in another type of scenario where, let's say we're not dealing with a virus, but schools are just faced with overcrowding. In this case, we have overcrowding not caused by extra individuals, but by not being able to put as many individuals in the building at one time. The go-to scenario for schools is to go to double sessions. And so I guess I would ask, if you want me to try to maintain space and get everyone in, do you want me to look at double sessions? I know that, that has to be a question for the whole group, but um, I guess I would throw that out there as kind of like the only other space to go to if you say keep the spacing and get all the kids in. I, for me personally, I would be interested in seeing what those look, what those scenarios look like. And I know this is challenging because we're asking you to, um, to, to expand upon a, a number of scenarios here, and that's a lot of work. But I do think it would be useful to see what that looked like. Um, I also think there's, again, how can we be creative? Can we think about a four-day um, school day for all students, but to have that staggered? Can we also think about, I mean, I hear you that there's a lot of heat early on in the summer um, or earlier in the summer than when school typically starts. And also if, if students are outside, um, that might help mitigate some of those conditions and make them a little bit more, um, more bearable uh, and, and have learning be more effective. So I guess it's just, um, it's thinking about how can we just think creatively and differently a little bit about this? So yes, I would be open and, and excited to see something that that staggered timing or thought creatively about what timing looked like. Okay, thank you. Um, I inadvertently lowered member Fallon's hand um, after I lowered member Levy's hand. So member Fallon is actually next in line. So member Fallon. Thanks. Um, seeing as how we're at almost three hours and still on the first agenda item. I just want to say, um, I know that we all want, uh, that we're hearing that parents want to get their kids back to school um, and get face time. And, I, and I've and i definitely heard loud and clear that um, our seventh through 12th graders want to be in the buildings. And um, But I think the reality is, is that there is going to be some remote learning. And I want to make sure that we are providing our teachers with um, with the tools to do that well and to feel um, that they are prepared to do that um, if it becomes necessary to go back to that model um, at any point. Um, and so I, I would like to really investigate um, the going to a half day once a week for professional development pur purposes. I know that um, growing up that we did that in my district and it worked very well. Um, to know that you had a half day every Wednesday that was used for professional development and whatever else you needed. Um, it was great for planning and for common planning periods. So I would, I, I feel like we're asking a lot of everyone right now and that maybe that would be something to consider um, moving forward while we're making all these adjustments and plans. Um, and then uh, I really, want to encourage I, every year. I mean, I remember last year in the fall showing up for open house at the high school um, and discussing getting um, window film for one side of the building, the second floor or third floor uh, side of the building because it was so hot in there even by eight o'clock at night um, and promising that it was something we were going to look into because the teachers and the students were just boiling. The thought of uh, students going back to school wearing masks and teachers wearing masks during that and kind of the anxiety around it all. Um, I really think that we need to have outdoor spaces available, sunshades, um, tents, whatever it takes, um, because I think that the six foot distance is going to be impaired, imperative. Um, and I think that we are really underestimating what the combination of trying to teach and speak and learn wearing masks um, at the beginning of the year when students are already anxious and wearing masks and that heat is going to be like for certain parts of the buildings. Um, so I would love it if you could look into the double sessions. Um, and I think everything else has probably already been said. Thank you. 
Dr. Prost, anything to say on that? Um, no, other than the, the one thing that seems to be emerging as a consensus is to pitch as many tents as possible for the fall. Okay, um, Member Gold. Hi, right, thanks so much. Um, so first a clarifying question and then something else. Um, will any scenario that we come up with also provide a remote option for students who choose or need to remain at home um, in September? Like, is that, a, is that a definite no matter what that Northampton is gonna be providing that, op needs to provide or will be pro providing that option? Yes, it's, it's, it's my reading of the opening guidance that that has to be a part of the plan. Okay, so any, so even like the full plan that they said is still there would be um, kids or who need to medically or, or by parent, you know, choice that they, they stay at home and Northampton would provide remote learning then for those kids. That's correct. Okay. Um, then I wanted to just uh, bring up and see if, um, you know, because I know in our discussions we talked about a potential, I don't know if it was called scenario 12 or what have you, but um, sort of along the lines of um, the idea where it's it, in, to develop the, in the hybrid model where teachers would be working with two cohorts during the day. The first cohort in the morning would be in person, and then the second cohort would be in the afternoon in remotely. And what, and what that would look like, it's a big ask of families in, in the community, but it would ensure a rotation where every child gets um, face time with the teachers and it values the remote learning time. But it also establishes in the schedule an opportunity for time when teachers are teaching remotely. Because if I'm a classroom teacher and I have students that are working remotely, I need that time to be during my school day, right? Like we can't, their teachers are not going to be able to do that remote work outside of the school day. Um, and so, for example, 830, you know, if I'm a, a fourth grade teacher and I have 20 kids, um, 830 to 12, um, I would have 10 kids in front of me. I would be adhering to the six foot um, guidance, which would be really helpful. And then at 12 o'clock, students would go home for lunch. Um, and that would also enable teachers not only to take their lunch, but also have their prep, or I'm not sure what you call it in Northampton, but with the teacher's planning time, where they have their half hour or 40 minutes. Uh, you take your lunch, you take your prep, and then you engage in remote learning with the kids that were home. So if I, my other 10 kids who are working at home in the morning, that's my time to say to them, you know what, I'm gonna get online with you, either because you chose to stay home or because you're part of the kids that are coming in the next day. And I'm basically swapping, whether it's um, every day, every two days, an opportunity to see all of my kids and make the remote time meaningful. Um, the other addition to that that would provide for, is sort of like what uh, Member Fallon was saying there, is you could use the second half of the day in the beginning of the year for the professional development too. So rather than doing you know, the remote time in the afternoon, that could be teacher professional development time during their work day, if that makes sense. And um, so I was wondering if you had any chance to you know, think more on that or, um, or uh, what your thoughts are with that scenario. So the, the only thing that I think we'd have to take a look at is the actual contact time because my understanding is the combination of um, in face to face instruction and remote learning, verified remote learning with attendance taken, needs to meet the time and learning requirements that are currently on the books, with the possible exception of the waiver of some days we might get for professional development. So um, there is, a, there is, I think, in that, the, the one thing that I just worry about is. If you have students in the morning and students in the afternoon, they're essentially each getting a half a day. So, so I think that we're going to not make our contact time requirements in that case. Uh, well, but I guess just to clarify on that, um, and I hear what you're saying, the thinking would be that the students, and it's something that we've heard from parents and sort of that you shared in your slideshow, that the remote learning needs to be valued, that they have to say you are getting credit for that. If I'm an afternoon group student and say I'm a fourth grade teacher, I might say, listen, I'm gonna see you um, from 1.30 to three or whatever the window of time would be. From, you need to make sure you got that work done in the morning, right? So they're, they're gonna be doing work while they're not with, you know, there's, there's meaningful work that has to be done because there is gonna be FaceTime remotely with the student. 
and the next day I'm going to see you, right? So I might see you back live in person in the classroom, if that makes sense. You know, so when I send the kid, when you send the kids home with a bag lunch and for their prep or their break, they're going home, they might actually go home with an assignment, right? Because I mean, if you think of the length of the school day, if you take out lunch and you take the break, then you're really looking at an hour and a half or so, maybe two hours um, where you need to make up learning time. And those two hours, you can send them home with an assignment, if that makes sense. So I think that we can, you know, um, figure out ways to make that meaningful and it also makes it so that every teacher not only is in their own classroom, which is really important in terms of that building a community, right? Because a high school teacher could be doing this in the high school, the middle school teachers could be doing this in the middle school, the elementary can because you're just cutting your class in half essentially. Um, and so it builds that community piece for it. It gets the teachers in the room. It gives the time for the professional development. Um, the biggest ask is parents in the community that are gonna have to deal with the fact that kids are coming home for a half day. But if we're gonna prioritize equity and um, access and all that, I think that can, um, that might be something really worth looking at in terms of the, the, uh, the hybrid model we're looking at because um, we need to make sure that whatever the remote learning time is, is not empty time. And I feel like the only way to do that is to make sure that those kids know they're gonna be back in front of the teacher engaging in the work that they did at home. Um, and so I'd, I'd, I'd uh, love to see some, some version of something like that um, tweaked and also to figure out when are teachers um, going to be working remotely in their schedules because that, that becomes a huge headache as well in, in figuring that out. And I think a scenario like this does that if you give teachers part of their schedule where they're working remotely. With kids. Um, and other than that, I mean, I guess I would just second the whole piece about making sure second, you know, a lot of what everyone said, making sure secondary um, is as equally valued. And, you know, and I get the whole thing of, you know, maybe elementary needs it more, but I think I, I feel like we could go around in circles forever and ever saying, you know, come to the same place where you got to get everybody, and all the students uh, FaceTime, you know, it, as much as humanly possible. And I don't think you can value one grade level over the other, honestly. I think that everyone needs it. And so we got to come up with something that, that does that. Um, and yeah, I think that is, that's all that I got there. Thank you, Member Gold. Um, Member Busansky. Thanks. Um, I, you know, I had a lot of the, I had a lot of the same questions as other members. So I really um, appreciate, you know, that some of my questions have been answered and I'll just try to um, not be too repetitive. Um, I'm just curious, just kind of backing up to the description to the fully remote model. Um, I'm really glad that you developed a robust professional development model, but, um, and I feel like you laid out the costs for remote learning really well. I'm just curious about the costs of the professional development, paying staff, et cetera. Can you lay that out for me, Dr. Provost? So we, that's, I would say that that cost, which is about three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, is the upper, the upper range. That's the cost of bringing everybody in five days early to do professional development. Um, if we did some other model where we did early release days, um, so that staff could receive the professional development within the course of the school year, we could reduce that cost. Um, but we just sort of put it out there in the sense that we might have to prepare for opening in a remote model, we might need to do the training prior to the opening of the year. Got it. Okay, thanks. And in the um, slides, the term alternative staffing requirement, I, I don't know, can you explain what that means exactly? So sure, if, um, I don't have my blueprints in front of me right now, but say, um, just for an example, in at a, a six foot distancing in Bridge Street School in first grade, I might need four first grade. Right now there are two first grade teachers. So I have to figure out some way to teach the other two first grade. I don't, I don't have an answer for that at this point in time. When a scenario is picked and when a distance is picked, then I'll know how many classrooms I have to to staff with with educators, and then I can figure out what the options are for for um, staffing those classrooms. Got it. 
Is okay, that, and just what's, uh, sorry, did I interrupt you? Is that, is that clear? Yeah, What and what's a base room? Sorry, I just wanna make sure I understand my terms here. <laughs> base is the after school program at Bridge Street School. It currently uh, is taking a classroom, which would have to be vacated in almost all of these models. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I know we've talked, uh, you talked last time and uh, looking at the um, survey that the that NACE did, um, I'm just curious about um, what, how you're going to be able to manage, you know, which teachers want to come back and which teachers want to teach remotely and how that will kind of play out and sort of work out so that we have enough teachers to teach in person, et cetera, and have enough teachers and or have enough teachers to do the remote teaching that's necessary during a hybrid model. So again, I think that um, starts with the selection of a model because then I can determine how many remote teachers versus how many in-person teachers are required. Then I would post for the remote teaching positions because everyone at this point is in an an in-person mode and we'd, we'd actually be asking some teachers to transfer over and then we would um, we would fill the positions like we normally do um, in in the sort of ideal situation where we have exactly as many requests for transfers as we have vacancies they would just go in but it's very unlikely that it, it will be that either we will have um, an excess or a deficit in which case we will if it's an excess we will do interviews and, and determine which teachers would be best suited to the remote learning. If there's a deficit, then we would try to recruit some teachers and possibly involuntarily transfer some teachers to remote um, teaching. Got it. And um, our, so where, where do you feel like your position is on making sure that all teachers who don't want to come back in person don't have to? So, um, I think that that fits into the equation of, of trying to figure out which teachers to um, sort of prioritize for remote learning. But I, I can't say that we have, we're able to guarantee 100% that all the teachers who may not want to come back and teach in person can be slotted for remote jobs. You know, we, for example, we don't even know that we're going to be opening in a remote or a hybrid model. We could be opening all in person, in which case there really would be very few remote jobs. Or we could be opening all remote, in which case everyone would have to be remote whether they wanted to or not. Um, so there are just so many variables, but I think what we can do when we have a hybrid model um, selected is determine the number of teachers, post the positions, find um, people in the to fill the positions, and then see where we stand in terms of either an excess of teachers who don't want to come back or a deficit of teachers who um, want to teach in the remote learning and then then take it from there. Um, also knowing that that is going to be a provisional appointment, right? Because if we right. staff up staff up for hybrid and learn that it's fully remote or fully in person, then we'd have to move those people back either into their prior positions or keep, keep every move more people into the remote positions. Okay, thank you. And then I'm just wondering, because I don't see in any of the plans um, any kind of additional learning or additional attention to our high needs uh, learners. And I'm just curious how that, um, how that uh, you know, looking out for them fits into these plans. So in the, in the scenarios for scenario five and scenario two, where we're prioritizing K to six, we're giving every student, actually it's pre-K to six, every student pre-K to six in-person learning every single day. So I think it's the maximum in terms of intensity and frequency. In scenario five, where we have uh, the, the seventh and eighth graders split into a, a group and B group, we have Wednesday as an additional day. So the, that, the high risk students would be prioritized for the additional day. And then in the high school model, we actually have some leeway. So we're splitting, we're splitting the group into uh, four and teaching three sections per day. So everyone is coming in basically four days a week. 
but we also have enough flexibility within that to bring in some high high risk kids every day. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And then um, in the uh, models where there's four feet, um, so you know the elementary students are back pre-K through five in their own building. So is how many kids are in a classroom? Does that change at all as to what we had before the pandemic, or is it uh, fewer kids in a classroom, or how does that look? How how, how many roughly? So uh, the difference between six and five does not create that much additional space at um, six feet. It's more or less 10 to 12 um, students per class. At five feet, it's really 12 to, to 14, depending on the size of the class. At four feet, it's about 16 students per class. Okay. So it's fewer and than essentially most. what we had prior to the COVID. So three feet is essentially status quo. Okay, got it. And um, let me just see if I have any more. Um, so I guess, you know, I really lean towards uh, scenario five over scenario two. I, you know, my thinking has I don't know if it's evolved or clarified, but after all the conversations and emails and readings, um, I just feel like it's really important that middle and high school has FaceTime as well as elementary school. So I, I lean towards taking scenario two completely off the table and working on scenario five. Um, you know, kind of drilling down and looking at scenario five, it does seem to me that the research is showing that for elementary school kids, um, closer is that they're less likely to spread it, uh, you know, for all the rude things that everyone has said before, um, and that maybe we could go to, down to four feet. Um, but I think we're gonna learn a lot in the next month or two. We're learning so much so fast. Um, so I, I don't, I know that doesn't solve anything or make anything easier but it does make me want to stay closer to the five or six feet mark for all grades. Um, but um, it does seem like the uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers in the five feet and six feet um, models are getting sort of the short end of the stick. And it seems like if we could figure out another place for the fifth and sixth graders to go, it would really um, help free up, or really just the fifth graders and that JFK could continue to be a sixth, seventh and eighth grade building and NHS could continue to be a nine through 12 building. So my question is, can't we come up with an alternative space for that fifth grade, for our fifth graders somehow? Um, I just, you know, we know that we're going back slowly, we're reopening slowly, and I just think there has to be some other spaces available so that we could um, increase safely at six feet distance, getting seventh, uh, seventh and eighth graders more face time and getting the high schoolers more face time, having all five grades in and out of that high school um, under that six feet model just seems really um, just really limiting. So um, I know I brought this up before, but you know I can't imagine the senior center is going to reopen. I don't know if the libraries are going to re when they will reopen. Um, it just seems like there uh, isn't there a way to kind of look at that differently so that we can sort of open it up for middle and high school a little more. So we did do a quick survey of city properties, and I don't think that's going to pan out. For us, we, I mean, there might be some space, but I don't think enough to, to capture the number of kids we're discussing. What I think our best bet for increasing spaces is the tents, which is why that's what I've been pushing our central services to, to line up for us. Um, and in five of the six schools, we have lots of room to place tents. Um, so I think that's, that's probably our best option there. Okay, is there a reason that we couldn't put tents in, is it Lampson Park outside of Bridge Street? Who who owns that park? Whose property? The city, city property. City property and there's no reason, but why couldn't we put tents on it if it's city property? Any no, thoughts on no, that? Nobody's asked us yet, but the Parks and Rec Commission controls it and DPW takes care of it, but no, I, I don't think we've gotten that far along with um, with the discussion, so. 
Okay. I don't think it's been foreclosed. I just don't think there's been a proposal. Okay. So it sounds like that might be a possibility. Um, but you had mentioned earlier, Superintendent, that tents would be used for something like, uh, you know, a band or chorus, which I completely understand, or some of those things. But what I'm hearing is it might be more useful to use it as just an additional classroom space so that we could have kids more spaced out and maybe keep the fifth grades at the elementary school, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that it couldn't. I'm just saying that there are some classes that really can't happen indoors as, as we understand the, the recommendations right now. So in order to keep those classes functional and alive, I would wanna to try to prioritize them for the outdoor spaces. That right, that right, start. and right. Well, and we know that band only happens in the middle and high school. So that's not the issue at elementary school level. I wish there was band at the elementary school level, but there isn't. Um, I wish in a post pandemic world, there was band at the elementary school level, but there won't be. So, um, so I, anyway. All right, I think enough said. That's uh, really where I'm leaning right now. Thank you very much for all of this. You're welcome. Member Condon, you're the next uh, member with a hand up. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll, I'll be succinct with my comments. Uh, for the social distance number, uh, I'll put my opinion uh, along with many others um, in terms of the number. I don't I haven't seen any data that suggests COVID operates differently in Massachusetts. So I think six feet uh, should be the number that we use. I don't, as, as tempting as three, four and five feet uh, are and the possibilities they open up, um, I, I just, I don't, I don't think that's safe. Um, going back to the professional development, I know you tied a lot of the professional development to the first scenario. But uh, as Member Gold and uh, I think Member Fallon mentioned, uh, the reality is that as much as the state wants to get every kid in the classroom, they're not going to all be in the classroom. So we're going to have to provide that professional development at one level or another, regardless of which scenario we go with, correct? Well, we're going to have to provide it because we don't know when we might have to switch to remote learning. Even if we started with all in person, we could, based on the behavior of the virus, one or two weeks later be changing back to all remote. So that's why we were thinking front loading the professional development might make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I, yeah, I just want to make, make it clear that one way or another that professional development is happening. Uh, and then I guess my, my last question uh, about tents, how many tents are you envisioning per building? I don't have a tent per building ratio. Um, we're trying to see what we're able to source at this point. And um, then I think we would equally distribute whatever we were able to obtain based on a per pupil ratio. Okay, thank you. That's all I have for now. You're welcome. Okay, um, member Kaufman. Thank you, I'm back. So. Um, just a few things I wanted to um, say. Um, first, like everybody else, I think I, I can't um, be more appreciative of all the work that Dr. Provost, you and your team has done. Uh, really impressed with the fact that even just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about PD and enhanced PD. And then all of a sudden we have um, a whole litany of potential courses and instructors in, in the midst of this you know, summer is here now and a lot of people are looking for downtime, but this is gonna be just a crazy summer. So wanna thank everybody for their time and efforts that everybody are putting in. Um, I just wanna say that, you know, I read, and I had some discussion with uh, other people on the school committee, but I read the um, DASA report, the DASA reopening plan slightly differently, um, more so in terms of what Dr. Provost introduced it as. I, I really don't think that I really think the department is looking at all kids returning to school or almost all kids returning to school in the fall um, full time, K, pre-K through 12. I think that's clear in their message, but not clear enough. And I would ask Dr. Provost if you could really enforce the commissioner to make a clearer statement about that. But I think it's, I think it's written throughout this in their own sort of way that basically is saying that the focus now is on how are you gonna get kids back to school? And if the environment changes, that you need to then rely on two other options, either hybrid or 
remote. And to me, that's a fundamentally different plan of action than saying, let's decide as a community which is best, because I'm not really not sure we have a choice. This is coming from somebody who two weeks ago was adamant that we stick with just scenario one. I felt completely unsafe and insecure about putting any adults, much less kids, in a situation where they would be um, in an unsafe situation. So needless to say, I was shocked by the Desley report. But that's really kind of neither here nor there. I, I do think if you haven't read the report and you read it at least through the lens, or are they possibly saying that we need to return to school full time for every kid? I think you'll find that that's what they're doing. And um, as I said last week, I would never support something like that. And I would really have a hard time budging from scenario one if I didn't get more medical um, studies, more research, more capturing what other uh, countries have done, et cetera, et cetera. And I think Desi has done a reasonably good job at that. And so I'm opening up my eyes a little bit more to what the studies are saying. Uh, Member Levy uh, sent forward a couple of really great studies on, er, on uh, elementary school kids. And it looks like uh, it's unbelievably rare that elementary school kids pass the virus on to adults, much less on to their fellow kids. So I, I do think there's a lot more to learn, but I, I do think that um, Dr. Vo Dr. Provost, I, I, I guess this is where it's all going is that I really think you need to tell us when you need and what you need from us because I just empathize with you and your team. I don't know how in the world you can wait much longer for us to if we're gonna vote on this or we're gonna push forward one model over another, I just, I don't want you to constantly go back and replan and revisit this when there's so much work that we need to do between now and September. So have you thought about like, what's the drop dead last deadline for, for you to get what you need from us? And can yes, you well, grab it and let us know? Cause I wanna yeah, I want to so make sure you have the time you need. Thank you. Uh, originally, I thought tonight would be the night. Um, that's why we have this meeting. Uh, the reality is that the regular July meeting is only nine days away. So I think we could have, um, I, I don't think it would be devastating to wait till that um, evening for a, uh, an answer. But And also, the reality is that we're only asking for the answer on the third scenario that we have to provide, right? right. We all remote already done and that's one of the ones required by the state the all in person I haven't done but I think it's clear if you can't fit all the students with four feet the only way to, to do the all in plan required by the state is to go to three feet um, so it's really just a question of what's the hybrid model that that you want me to work out so that means that I can at least be working on the all in um, model a little bit more between now and the next meeting and if there's more direction that you want to go me to go to with the hybrid model um, that's that's what would be helpful for me to get tonight like if you want me to to basically stay with five but try to continue tweaking it so that i get more time for in-person instruction for secondary students if you want me to consider going to double sessions to see what that would like look like if you want me to um, try different spacing arrangements for different students based on age um, buying more tents, all those things are things I can put into the hybrid model and, and could even to a certain extent put into the, um, the all in model. But um, it's really, really just a question of the hybrid that we have to choose at this point. Right. So yeah, I think you, I, I think I just want to remind you that if we, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, don't we need to come up with a plan to submit to the Department of Education that talk that says how we're going to bring back as many kids to in school full day as possible? We actually have to submit a plan that says how we'll bring them all back. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. My... Right. Yes. And that's what they're expecting from us. So if that's something we're going to do, and again, I'm not endorsing it by any stretch of the imagination, but if that's something we're going to need to do, I think you heard some many great ideas tonight about how we can do that in the safest way possible. And that includes maximizing space, potential community space, as, um, as, as Member Buzanski brought up. Um, or tents, outdoor space, um, potentially relooking at indoor space um, that is not being used to its capacity within schools. Double session is another idea. So 
despite the fact that the department is asking us to come back a uh, full day, I don't think they're looking for the same model that we left off with pre-COVID. So I think you've heard a lot of good ideas and I know you're gonna capitalize on that. Um, I would also say that if we are told that we need to return to school full day, that if the environment changes and the governor or the commissioner changes their mind, I have a hard time believing they would then go to a hybrid model. I think they would probably say you need to go to fully remote. So we'll find out more as things go, but I, I think the hybrid model is not only the, the third model that we're discussing, but it's also the least likely that we're gonna end up going in that direction. I, I, that's the message I'm hearing from Desi. That said, I just wanna ask another question that was brought up by um, somebody earlier during public session. And I'm wondering if you've heard anything or if you've given any thought to how in the world we're gonna make up for the lost learning time that kids experience over those last three months. Um, I know they receive remote learning. I'm hearing pretty clearly that that was mixed at best. Um, has the department given you any sense on how they're gonna help communities make up for lost learning time for the students? Uh, the only, well, I have had lots of thoughts about that. And so I'll, I'll deal with that first and then I'll address the DESE piece second. Um, the first step is going to be assessing the students to find out where the learning gaps are. There is a plan being put together by the curriculum group. It actually um, was reviewed today. Um, I think the, the cost of that plan is also um, quite a bit. I, I think that uh, we estimate the cost of assessing and, um, and getting ready to remediate students to be about $62,000. Um, we think that that can be done very quickly. We think it can most likely be accomplished within the first month of school. And then um, we do fortunately have a system set up at least through the middle school of um, providing remedial instruction to students who are behind um, for reasons other than disability. Um, and we also have uh, special ed for students who are, are in the group um, who've already been identified as students who are behind because of a disability. The, um, the only, and then the, at the high school, it'll be a little bit more of a challenge. Um, one of the, one of the um, pieces that we've put in place already is the option of taking Integrated Math 1 is a full year course. We think that um, there are some students who are, maybe have been on, would have been on track to take IM1 as a semester course. that are now gonna have to take it as a full year course. And our assessment will, will show us that and, and help us to identify students for that. And then there are many um, courses that are just gonna have to be adjusted because um, some of the skills that students would have normally received as prerequisite skills and prior courses just won't be there. Um, so yeah. we'll be adjusting that as well. In terms of um, what's available from DESE, I have seen some grants um, to run school on the weekends and run school during vacations um, to try to provide more contact time and more learning for students who are um, far behind. But I, I think that that money is likely to be prioritized for more high needs districts than ours. So I'm not sure how much we'll be able to capitalize on there. If um, after paying all the bills, it turns out that some of the stimulus money could be used for um, um, Saturday school or vacation school or um, longer school days. Um, maybe we can do that as a way of remediating uh, some of the learning gaps. I just, I can't at this point say, I'm comfortably know that we're gonna have the funding to do yeah. that. Okay, well, I, I greatly appreciate in the midst of everything else you thinking about this, it's, um, Dr. Provost, it's, it's as much of a concern to me as anything. And um, I know you said earlier today that DESE was open to expanding the school year. I don't exactly know what that means, but to maybe provide additional PD. But I would, I would ask uh, again with how DESE, I don't know how DESE is gonna support districts to pay for that or whether they're just gonna allow it and then expect local municipalities to pay for it themselves. But I would likewise say it's probably more important that we get extra days for teachers to teach kids who are falling behind. Um, some of the studies you shared with us is um, pretty clear that learning, losing three months and maybe more time could have monumental impacts on kids. And um, I said this last time we met and I'll say it again, that we owe it to our students that 
They should not be learning less than their peers who went to school before them. And it's not fair to expect our educators um, to go, you know, to be able to make up for lost instructional time without giving them more time to do the teaching that we need. So I don't know what the solution is there, but um, we just need to really make sure that kids who are coming to school way behind, that's gonna be a huge problem. Getting them back to school, teaching them, whatever, I understand that's the most immediate concern, but I do appreciate your concurrent thinking about assessing them, finding out where they are, but um, we really need to come up with a better way to ensuring that we're gonna make up for their up to three months of learning. We know that many kids didn't participate in remote, and we also know that some kids who did just didn't get nearly as much out of it as they might have if it was in person. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Members. I think you called on me, although I think you yes, needed Member Seraphi, <laughs> Member Seraphi Cox. Sorry about Thank that. You. No worries. Um, uh, Superintendent, you laid out the costs of scenario one pretty clearly. I'm wondering, uh, I didn't hear you talk as much about the costs of scenarios two and five. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe you can talk a little bit about that or maybe it's just very unclear because of the alternate uh, alternative staffing that's required. So that's my first, well, that's, that's my first question and then I have a second question. You're exactly right. It's the main cost will be staff. Um, there were some transportation issues involved, but I think those costs were addressed by a vote taken last meeting. Um, so knowing which which version of which scenario we're going with will allow me to put a finer point on the cost of um, those scenarios. Okay. Um, and then um, the second is, I just want to clarify from uh, Member Kaufman's question and your answer about next steps. So what I'm understanding is that the vote tonight would not be a vote if we were to take a vote tonight or, at, or on July 9th. It's not a vote about what September actually looks like. It's a vote about what you submit to DESE. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. We have to submit three models. That doesn't, it does, Desi's not asking us to submit one model that we're going to implement. It's three models to be ready to implement. So I, and my expect, could be wrong, but my expectation is they're going to say, okay, implement this, you know, fully remote or hybrid or all in person when we get close to the start of school based on what's happening with the virus. So you're anticipating that we are setting ourselves up for a menu, as it were, and then the state will mandate which of those menu options we have to implement? That's, that's my belief. I don't 100% know that, um, but I know this is um, that the, the mandate to us has been to provide these, to choose the three scenarios and to submit them to the state approximately two weeks before the opening of school. Okay. That, I mean, I'm, I'm glad for that clarity, but I'm surprised, I guess, that the state would uh, not allow the, like if they're going to mandate that everybody be completely in person and Northampton is not comfortable with that, could we still opt for one of the other options? I don't know if that's an option or not. Well, hopefully we'll have more information soon. I, I, I want to echo what other me uh, members have said about um, thanks for your and your team and everybody uh, who had been involved in this planning and everybody in, honestly, everybody in the public who has, um, has offered their thoughts and concerns and voices to this because it has really enriched the conversation and, uh, and clearly it's an incredibly complex situation that you're, that you're grappling with. Thank you. And, and I know that's a little bit of a disappointing answer. I'll, I will say it's kind of frustrating for us too as superintendents 
I'll tell you the, the one refrain we've heard over and over again is you have to be ready to be nimble. You have to be ready to completely reconfigure your district on the, you know, a moment's notice throughout the upcoming school year. So I think um, they've told us to have the three plans ready. They haven't exactly told us how we're going to deploy them. Are you all set, Member Seraphie Cox? Yeah, I, I guess the, sorry, the, the last thing that I'll just kind of come to is I would just then really encourage us to be really mindful of what uh, you brought to us uh, at the last meeting where you were saying, these are the criteria that need to be fulfilled in order for us to return to in-person. And so, you know, um, I know that those criteria aren't on this presentation, but I just want to let members of the public know who are who may not have been on that meeting that there are some clear criteria uh, that were set out about how to assess whether or not it's safe to return in person. And, um, and I, I hear you that that may be out of your hands, but um, I, uh, it's my understanding that, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I would just encourage us to, to stick to clear criteria and data-driven decisions. Always a good, always a good model to go with. Member Voss. Thanks, that's a great segue to what I was gonna say. I, I honestly can't imagine sending everybody back in September um, and being able to afford to in a way that's safe. And for Desi to expect that any of us would just do that, I think is unrealistic. Um, maybe there's this crazy chance that this virus is gonna go away, but if you look at any map of this country and think about the colleges that are welcoming students back in late August and people traveling for other reasons, it just, um, seems so highly unlikely that I would be very supportive, Dr. Provost, of um, if we do have to come up with a scenario for sending everybody back, putting very little work into it and saying um, the only safe way, we, you know, this is me speaking, but that it seems possible is to hire twice as many um, staff and to have school run in two equal sessions, and it's going to cost us more than we can afford. So if you want to pay for it, we'll do it. And move on to planning for something that's actually more realistic about getting teachers and students reunited. And with that, um, what I was going to say before I realized that Desi actually wanted that, which I did not realize, that I will reread the report. I didn't take that away and I don't doubt it. I was shocked by other things in the report as I was reading it. Um, I, what I would like to see a plan for I think is something really safe, like extra conservative for September. And I realize this puts burden on families who want and need their kids to get back to school. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but maybe it's on the order of 25% time face-to-face -face for most kids and extra for kids who are at risk, those with IEPs and other at-risk kids. Um, and then if September goes well, um, bumping it up to 50% in October and being able to be flexible going back and forth with groups of kids. And I think member Gold made some really good suggestions about how to start thinking about combining remote learning with um, in-person. But that's my suggestion. Let's go in for a few weeks, more conservative, get things going, let the teachers and kids get to know each other to the extent they can and see where this virus is. I, I want to thank you for bringing that up again. That is something that we discussed last week. And I just wanted to point out that that kind of logic is also embedded in these charts. If you look at it, you could say, okay, we'll start at six feet and go to five and go to four, depending on whether we see cases in our school. Another option you could consider. So um, I just want to do a time check. Um, we're at 10 o'clock um, and we've completed item A. It doesn't seem like we're prepared to vote tonight. So superintendent, what um, we have another meeting on July 9th. Are you hoping that you'll be able to crystallize the three scenarios that you need to submit to DESE as part of your required reporting by then? Well, I think it's really uh, just the middle scenario because I think we have 
um, agreement on the first scenario. I haven't heard anyone speak against doing the professional development for the remote learning, getting the materials we need for remote learning. So I think that plan we can start to, to implement and get ready to report to the state. Um, as Member Voss said, the planning for all the, the full return is actually not that labor intensive. It's, it's one of the simplest models out there. Um, it just requires us to, to um, calculate how much space we need for, for the students and, and which level you feel comfortable at. So I can, I can do that at different levels. And, and on July 9th, I think that's the date of the meeting, you could tell me which one you want to go with. So I think it's really, really just the um, hybrid scenario that needs some finalization. And so I guess I just need to ask, does anyone want to advocate for any of the other scenarios or do you want me just to try to make scenario five better with more in-person time for secondary students? Repeat that, please. Sorry, I didn't get exactly catch that. The question is for for my continued work on the hybrid scenario. Should I try to make adjustments that get more secondary students in the um, person to person instruction, which would be either a development of scenario five, or do you want to start over with something else? Like, for example, in the state guidance, they kind of really strongly said, don't try to make it too fancy. Just do week on week off for everyone is your hybrid scenario. If anyone wants me to go back to that, we could do that. Week on week off for everyone, John? Yes. Member, um, it's Member Levy, sorry. Uh, so I, I guess I, I don't want to overcomplicate things, but I do, before I answer that question, want to point out that for our for everybody in person all of the time scenario, I don't know that it's, I, I just want to make sure that we're still thinking creatively and we're not just saying everybody's back to pre-COVID, but that we're, we're saying, as some of my colleagues have said, and as I said earlier, that we're using tents, we're using uh, creative measures to ensure that people are seeing each other uh, still within safe distances. So, so I, j I think, I just wanna make sure when you say it's really simple that, that, that those components are still gonna be a part of it. Can you clarify that for me? Yes, that, that was part of my thinking. Um, so in terms of the, the discussion we had earlier about double sessions, you know, one of the things that I could foresee is saying, okay, so if we're going to do all in with six feet, then it's going to have to be double sessions. Or if we, you know, go to five feet, it might look a little bit less severe or four, and then three might be the pre-COVID more or less. Okay. So, okay. Um, thanks. Then the, I guess for me, for my part, if, if it's not too much to ask. I would love to see a build out of scenario five that incorporates more face-to-face -face time and more creative thinking about how to do that for middle school and high school students into that model. And then again, if it's not too much to bring back a second model, I think, um, I, I, I imagine you want me to go back to the initial 10 or 11 or 12 that you gave us and I don't have that right in front of me but something that does uh, do a bit more um, rotating or splitting of time, I think would also be, I would be interested to see what that looks like. And I'll let my colleagues weigh in on, I, I'm, I haven't thought through, cause I had my hand up, sorry, before you asked that question. So I, I haven't thought through exactly what I think that could look like. So I'll keep thinking and come back if my colleagues don't say things that I agree with. Member Voss. I just want to say I would like to see other brainstorming. I don't want to be stuck within scenario five. Um, call it what you want, but there's ideas in later scenarios that are all good. And I think combining some of those ideas and I just really encourage getting input 
from a large group of people, especially um, people in, in different schools. It might look different for elementary and for middle and high school, and that would be okay. So whether it's principals working with teachers in those schools or some other entity, but I would like to see some really well thought out alternative to scenario five that incorporates a lot of things we've heard in this conversation that we're bringing public because we've talked to so many community members. Member Gold. Um, yeah, I mean, regarding which scenario to look at and what you shared about the week on week off, um, just in, the thing that I've, I've heard from teachers is there's that big risk of essentially being like a week of school, a week of vacation, a week of school, a week of vacation, in kids' minds. And if they're not having some frequent contact with their teacher, um, we're going to be that week off, that non week of in front of in front of teachers is going to be hard for students to remain engaged and think that learning is relevant. So, um, I mean, it does work scheduling wise and simplicity wise in many ways, but when we come down to look at the day to day, for teachers and students, I think it's um, it's a very challenging one to make the learning relevant when they're home. And um, yeah, I really, you know, just encourage you to look at the possibility of, you know, a hybrid model, like sort of the, you know, was being shared before that I was sharing with you where you have in the morning kids there in the afternoon, kids working remote, and then you kind of just gradually release it because you can kind of build on and can we get more students in or not or less students and you create the structure where teachers have the time and the professional development and the opportunity to build the remote learning in case we have to go back there, right? Like we have that, um, that work being done. And we also have the work being done of coming back as well, it's sort of like a, a, a little by little uh, version. So, um, I mean, I've heard from a variety of schools that, um, you know, and, and, and thinking about teams and thinking from teachers, what that could look like. And it seems like a it, it addresses a lot of the challenges that schools face when you think of lunch and reset, lunch and prep and all that. And I think it just, uh, it simplifies things. So I'd, I, would I would encourage something like that if it was something the other members would uh, be interested in hearing and if the community would be interested in it, uh, NACE and everybody. Member Kaufman. <clears throat> Dr. Provost, I'm wondering, like you hear all this information from us. I know that, um, I'm just wondering what happens now Earlier, you had sent out to us a series of working teams that you had. Do you have a group that you work with to try and incorporate this information and get feedback on it and then move it to the next level? Or are you working more individually at this point? No, we work everything as a group. Um, so that the core group, which is me and the principals um, and directors meets on a daily basis. And then the other members of the peripheral groups meet uh, one day a week with us more or less. Um, yeah. So we work we work the models through every the, that whole constellation of people. These models, these reopening models go through different working groups that you had. So there's a number of people that are, are getting feedback and is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I mean I, I I somebody said it I forget now even though it was two minutes ago. I think it was member Levy but I, <laughs> Um, I, I think the idea of taking, we're, you know, we're not experts here. We will obviously will make a decision, I guess, but I wouldn't be opposed to you trying to summarize everything we've said. I know some of the people on the working groups are probably in tune with this meeting tonight. And I really would not be opposed to you coming back and saying, I, we think we've heard everything and we think this is the model to go with. Um, I just feel like if we keep leaving the door open, um, it's not going to get shut. So um, you've heard from us twice. You've taken our considerations, um, not only from last week, but I think there's a tremendous amount of other good advice that we're giving you now. And personally, if, we, if you can wait till July 9th, I would propose that that's the last date that we need to make a decision if that's what you're waiting for so you can move ahead. And I would value personally um, a decision that is um, presented to us because you've gotten the input from a wide variety of people from your different working groups. That's how I feel. Okay. Yeah. Member Levy. I second what Member Kaufman just said, and I'll just credit where credit is due. I believe it was Member Voss who initially said that, but thanks for giving me the credit. Um, I. <laughs> 
Uh, so I, I completely agree. I would love to see you all come back with, here's what we're summarizing based on all of the, the input and what folks are saying. And I'll add two things to that. One is, I do think it's worth considering a model where some of the younger kids are potentially closer together if that allows uh, more kids to have face-to-face -face times at the older at the older grades. And I also strongly um, am opposed to a week on week off for all of the members that uh, Member Gold mentioned. And as we think about needing regularity for working parents and low income um, families, um, every one of these scenarios is gonna be hard for working parents and for low income families and for families that are gonna need to figure out childcare. And if we can find the least horrible one that would be really great. That's a great point. You know, we are not, none of these options are ideal by any means. And that I think has to be sort of the, the preamble to all of our reopening options. Okay, so it sounds like we've reached a stopping point for item A on our agenda. Um, so, um, Superintendent, you'll you'll come back with us to try to hopefully synthesize everything that we've thrown at you tonight, and um, and s try to come up with some uh, a hybrid to the hybrid that um, that tries to meet that. The next item on the agenda, item B, is a discussion. Uh, there's no vote scheduled. Um, it's entitled "Student Safety and Discipline Without an SRO," and um, uh, member Serafie Cox is listed as the person uh, leading this discussion. So I'll turn it over to member Serafie Cox. Thank you. Um, so this agenda item was originally going to be a vote on uh, uh, the elimination of the memorandum of understanding with the Northampton Police Department um, and the Northampton Public Schools that allowed um, the school resource officer to, um, to operate in the schools. And uh, since that agenda item was put on the agenda uh, or was requested by myself to be put on the agenda, um, the uh, Northampton Police Department has eliminated the position of the school resource officer. So um, that piece itself uh, was moot, however, um, it, it does offer an opportunity uh, for a discussion about, uh, for one thing, whether we want to, as a, as a school committee, make a statement similar to what Amherst Pelham uh, schools, uh, school committee did uh, around a resolution um, saying, we don't want, you know, regardless of whether or not there becomes money available in future uh, Northampton Police Department budgets, we, we don't want a school resource, school resource officer uh, in the Northampton Public Schools. So that's one question. Uh, another uh, discussion is just kind of about what we would imagine as, uh, as being, um, something that we should put in place uh, in light of the fact that we won't have a school resource officer. Um, and uh, I, I am aware that whatever sorts of uh, discipline that uh, practices that we would put in place, be they, I've heard a lot of folks talk about restorative justice, that is where I uh, would put my vote uh, um, towards restorative justice practices and, uh, and perhaps the creation of a restorative justice program. Um, but I'm keenly aware that that also takes funds. And so um, one question that I have um, as, uh, as a member of the school committee and, and looking at the support that the, that the city was giving through the, uh, uh, the, the student resource officer before, I have opinions about what that support was, but uh, um, it was it was funds that that were allocated for the schools um, to perhaps request that 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 money come back to the schools to uh, support uh, restorative justice program. 
So there's kind of a lot in what I just said. Um, I would love to hear committee members' thoughts on what, um, what sort of discipline practices should be in the schools, whether or not you would support a, a, a resolution akin to Amherst Pelham. If so, then uh, we can bring that to the July 9th uh, school committee meeting for a vote. Um, and uh, I haven't gotten a copy of that resolution yet. I uh, reached out to um, one of the members of the Amherst Pelham School Committee to, to get a copy of it, uh, but it essentially said we, we're not interested, you know, we, we don't want to have a, a school resource officer in our schools in the future. Um, and, then, uh, and then how you would feel about, uh, about requesting from the city that we have uh, um, the funds that were originally allocated for the school resource officer, student resource, excuse me, the SRO <laughs> to be uh, um, allocated for the schools uh, to, to, to go towards a, whatever sort of program we would want to see. And for me, that would be restorative justice, but I also offer it up uh, to you to hear your thoughts. Member Levy, you have your hand up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Serfie Cox, for, for putting this on the agenda. And thank you to the community members who have been really vocal and those who spoke in the in the um, in the public comments about this this issue. Um, I want to really strongly voice my support for uh, um, a resolution, I don't know if that's the right word, um, for our school committee to um, strongly oppose a, a school resource officer in the schools, even if funding does become available. And I will be um, eager to see the wording of the Amherst Pelham um, resolution uh, so, that, so that we can really think about um, how that can work for our community. I also really strongly um, I'm in favor of a uh, uh, restorative justice program for pre-K through 12. Um, as I mentioned earlier, restorative justice is really a piece of restorative practices that um, accomplishes a number of things, building community, um, teaching students to manage conflict, lowering suspension rates, lowering expulsion rates, empowering students, empowering student leaders, um, bringing more equity. There are really amazing models, uh, one of which is in Holyoke um, that we can learn from that, um, that encourage student leaders to be a part of creating the kind of community that they would like to see in their schools um, and empowering student voice. And um, just the, all of the data about the, the school to prison pipeline restorative practices is something that very much um, interrupts that. And so I would also like to strongly support the, um, the request to the city that the SRO funding be allocated towards supporting a restorative practices program for the school district. And I'll throw out there would also be a really great addition to our city in general. Um. So before I call on the next person, I guess I should just, um, by way of explanation, so the, um, there was not, uh, so um, Officer Wallace um, is a patrol officer um, who had been detailed to the schools. So um, the, the police department was paying his salary, but was not having him be part of the regular patrol uh, rotation. Um, and so when the, um, given the budget cuts that occurred and the elimination of five, um, five uniformed officers, um, he's basically been put back onto a normal patrol just because they've lost uh, patrol officers. So um, there was not separate money for a, uh, for a resource officer per se that, um, so he's basically just being redeployed uh, because of the shortage in the patrol officers. So uh, that's sort of the situation. Obviously, um, if the schools wanna develop a 
uh, restorative justice program. That's certainly something that can be part of a budgetary discussion. Um, but that's uh, that's sort of the backstory on the at least how the school resource officer was funded. Um, and so his position was being funded as a patrol officer. He just wasn't um, being required to be uh, um, as part of the regular patrol. He had been redeployed um, in sort of a Monday through Friday position with the schools. Member Voss, you have your hand up next. If Member Fallon was ahead of me, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm happy to go. I think her screen froze and then she dropped off, but she's so um, um, if you want to yield to Member Fallon, that's fine. Member Fallon. Thank you, Dr. Voss. Um, yeah, I so I just I guess addressing all the points you raised. Um, I'm fine with supporting a resolution. To be honest, I, I'm, it's it's non binding. The school committee changes every two years. I Right now, I don't know that I feel like it's strong enough. I'm more concerned with the fact that there's there's the Massachusetts state law requiring school resource officers. And I know that that's being addressed right now by the state legislature. I spoke with Senator Comerford about it on Thursday. Um, and so I would actually like to wait and see what changes are being, and I know you can get a waiver for that, but I would, I there are changes that are in the works being made to that law. And I would actually like to maybe become, like use our advocacy to make sure that um, our voices are heard in the, in, in the in what's going to change for that law, whether it's rescinded, whether, I, I'm not sure what's gonna happen with that. But I just, my only concern is that it's it, the resolution in itself is non-binding. I'm happy to support it, but, um, I'm more concerned with the, the law that's on the book books. I know that Amherst has did not apply for a waiver. I don't think the law is actually enforced um, and it feels sort of meaningless in many ways, um, but that would be my preference would be to address the mass general law. Um, and then as far as restorative justice program, um, I would be absolutely supportive of that. Um, but once again, like everything else, I, I would like to be sure that we commit the time and resources and professional development to do it correctly um, and entirely and not just have it um, be something that we, you know, devote a day of professional development to or we, um, you know, have a few uh, t-shirts made up for students and, and call it. Like it needs to be an absolutely, uh, a, a large scale con commitment on the on the part of the district, um, and we need to devote the resources to it to make it successful, um, so that it's um, so that it's not just a gesture, an empty gesture on our part, and we can ensure that it's as successful as possible. Member Voss. Thank you. So I want to echo what members Levy and Serafi Cox said, um, in terms of a resolution, I would really fully support that. I appreciate member Fallon, your various perspectives on it um, and your support, but also your other information. Um, I, I'd like at Northampton to make a statement that this is really important and put together a resolution. And I'm excited to get the actual wording and not just the Gazette article reporting on it and see if um, we might make changes or if it would be very similar, I don't know, but I'd like to talk about that in July as well. Um, I'd like to even take it a step further. We had public comment last month or earlier this month um, asking us to consider some school committee policies that explicitly ask for police presence at certain events. And I don't have it all clear in my mind, but I would like us as a committee to look at those policies and maybe recommend that the policy um, subcommittee take a second look at them and bring them back to us and in terms and ab I absolutely support um, what I think we've talked about over the last couple of years in terms of a upcoming our code of conduct which is still under development and um, I know a lot of progress has been made but do you, having a restorative justice program that's meaningful and funded and um, not an afterthought through whatever mechanism we can, I'd like to talk about that. And Mayor Narkowitz, I think one question I have for you in response to how 
um, uh, Officer Wallace was funded and what the recent changes mean is if there is a 10% reduction in the police department budget um, and that therefore um, has essentially eliminated the SRO for now. Um, and just to be clear, I support um, making that more permanent through these other methods, but that 10%, would the school committee be allowed to ask for um, a certain amount of dollars? And I don't know what that amount of dollars would be to support a restorative justice program that would essentially take the place of the prior policy. Can, can we ask for money for that? Well, and, and that's what I said when, in terms of the budgetary request from the school committee, certainly that's um, something that's possible. I would just I would just say that the um, the funding that was eliminated is essentially was essentially coming out of our um, you know fiscal stability reserve fund. So we're you know we we we've lowered the amount that we've relied on from that. So um, all of this is relative as we wait to see what the state budget's going to be whether chapter 70, what chapter 70 is gonna be funded at, what other aid is gonna be funded at. So we'll have a clearer picture hopefully by August or September. So we'll probably be revisiting um, the 21 budget, hopefully not for bad reasons, but we'll have an opportunity to revisit it uh, once we have a clearer picture of what the, what, the, um, what the state budget will look like. But certainly if there's a program put together, that's certainly something that could be requested, yes. But obviously it has to compete with all the other, um, if you were at the city council meetings, you'll know that there were lots of people suggesting how those funds would be spent. Um, and for lots of things in the community, lots of other um, purposes within the community. Um, and so uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, um, um, competition for those funds, which I just have to remind people are, are um, one-time funds that are, um, yeah, so that we're still, are still somewhat tenuous given the state budget situation. So, yep. Uh, the next person is Member Condon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, uh, two things. First off, I'm in support of the resolution, but in terms of what could replace the SRO, I would think we would want to gather some input from the student body and the staff at the buildings themselves instead of making the decision for them about what they would like to see replacing the SRO in, in their buildings. That's it. Um, oh, Member Fallon. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly address um, something that Member Voss brought up um, in regards to the policies. I, you know, I just want to be clear. I, I don't know as chair of rules and policies how much more I can say this, but you know, I've gone through. I know exactly which policies are problematic, and I've gone through those. And you know, the one that's most egregious is from 1996. Is the last time our committee laid eyes on it. Um, there are two that have been removed, I don't even know when, by the MASC, and they shouldn't be in our manuals. There's one that was updated in 2014 to align with best practices, with DESE guidance, with all of the, um, there's one that we actually did vote to amend, but it's still not updated, the version that we voted on in 2018 online. And so it's now four hours into a meeting. And the last thing on our agenda are our policies, one of which we're voting, redoing a first reading because it's actually against the constitution. And so if we wanna go and address all these policies and get through all these policies that are statements of our beliefs as a committee, we need to start making them a bigger priority and put them closer to the front of the, at the top of the agenda. And so that's the only point. I'm happy to have you guys refer them to us, but we have so much policy work that we're behind on. Um, and I have all the changes for all of those policies um, and it wouldn't take long, but we, we just keep putting off our policy work. And I think that's a, that's a real shame. Member Gold. Um, thank you. 
And uh, thanks, uh, Member Seraphie Cox, uh, for bringing this to the conversation. Um, so I and I fully am excited and see uh, restorative justice practices coming to Northampton schools. I know that, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, Superintendent Provost and sorry if it was mentioned already, um, that it actually is a part of the new code of conduct already uh, that emphasizes restorative justice that's going to be developed. Um, is that correct, Dr. Provost? That's correct. This joint joint school council meeting is next is uh, July seventh to to ratify the new code of conduct. Great. Uh, so that's great to see that the work that's already in the works, and I hope it just continues to grow. Um, regarding the resolution, um, I think that it's really important for us as a community to have a conversation about this and really understand sort of how uh, Member Condon was sharing, uh, asking students and teachers and. Really making it a, a th um, really making it a conversation before we come up with a resolution, uh, so that it's the right fit for our community. Um, I think that um, we clearly need to be supportive of the national movement and the efforts going on. Um, at the same time, we need to make the right fit for what fit for Northampton's community and what we need. Um, for those of you who don't know, because uh, I know there's a lot of people in, in the public, I've been an urban public school teacher uh, for since 2000. Four, and I've been teaching in Springfield since 2008, where we have 90, over 90% 90 of our students are students of color. And um, the feeling down there about the SROs in my school coming from the community, from parents who have grown up and lived there and seen the important role of uh, police officers has been not to uh, detach from the police, but actually to build relationships with them. And they've actually looked for ways to create positive relationships where the Police learn to trust the students, and the students learn to trust and, and get support from the police. And I bring that up just in the sense that for my school in Springfield, that's what they need and that's what they want. And it's built on from the parent community, built on from the teacher community and the surrounding community and the police community, and how can they be supportive? And so I think that prior to we, us doing a resolution, I think it'd be really helpful, whether in partnership with Real, which would be a great avenue for us, but to have some public discourse about this. Um, so we really gather all the opinions, gather all the information, gather all the data, you know, maybe whether it's through a student survey or what have you, um, and teacher survey and community survey, really understand um, what the community is asking before we put forth a resolution. Member Kaufman. Uh, thank you. Um, Trying to get my head straight. Um, I, I think I, let me start with the SRO. Um, I, I, you know, if we, were, if we were voting on whether to have an SRO, then I think it would be critical to do the kind of things that Member Gold suggested. I mean, they, they all make a great deal of sense to me and I'm not, um, I'm not comfortable um, writing or uh, passing a resolution um, not only because we just have not heard from Dr. Provost and from guidance, and most importantly, we've heard tonight from two students, but I've also heard from a few students who are on the opposite side, who had just recently graduated and stated that they gained a great amount from their association with the SRO. It did surprise me when I read it, to be honest with you, but I, I can't discount that um, we just don't know enough. Um, but I think my point is, I'm concerned about moving in this direction. I understand the importance of it as a community of where we are now, but we're gonna take a vote and spend a lot of time discussing something that um, is a moot point. And I, don't, I just do not believe that we as a school committee should prohibit any future school committee members from voting on whether we have an SRO or not. Clearly in the past, there was a vote and I'll, predecessors voted okay, I think. I'm pretty, I'm, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe Member Fallon or Member Bozanski, if you were on five years ago, did, did the idea of having an SRO come to the school committee for your approval? Or was this a decision someone else made? You remember, Ms. Uh, Representative? I, I think Fallon? it was before my time. Oh, yeah, was it? before my time as well. Mayor yeah. Narkowitz, do you recall? Um, I believe it's, I don't know the date on the uh, on the MOA, but I think it even predates my time as uh, okay. as chair. So, yeah. in my experience, actually in Amherst, um, 
there was there was years ago there was a lengthy lengthy debate about getting an SRO at the high school. Uh, it did not pass, but I know I went to the school committee, and I'm familiar in other communities. And I guess my point is, I'm not just not comfortable at all having one school committee um, dictate to a future school committee that they can't discuss and consider a situation. Um, so I'd be more than happy to sign a declaration that says a SRO does not come to a school without school committee approval or needs school committee approval, but clearly situations change. Clearly we have an SRO, it sounds like for a really long time now, and without really understanding the impact of that SRO, uh, clearly, um, and most particularly from students that had that experience, I, I, just, I'm, I just don't have a strong feeling on this. I just know that the information has not been shared and um, I think we need a lot more information and I'm not thirsty for it. I just think we need to move on and discuss more important items than spend a lot of time on something that we're not really debating. There are no, there are no um, ideas to bring back the SRO in high school at our high school. If there was, we should spend as much time uh, as necessary. Regarding restorative justice programs, um, I couldn't be any more supportive of Member Levy's ideas. Um, years ago, I served on the high school council. I brought up very similar ideas to implement restorative justice practices, programs, change the code of conduct. Um, the principal and vice principal at that time gave it uh, very limited merit and gave me whether I would um, say very uh, condescending and insulting response to that. And I was pretty upset about it. Neither is with it the district anymore. That's why I don't mind bringing it up. But I am quite thrilled that we have um, a set of administrators now who have bought into the idea or have made a commitment, I should say, into the idea of developing restorative justice practices. I am as excited uh, for anything that we've done as a school committee I, and as a district, I am more excited about the new code of conduct um, than anything. I'm really anxious to see it. I know it was built off a model in Syracuse that has as its fundamental purpose or a fundamental approach to be restorative justice. Um, and we were handed a draft some time back that was probably too drafty for us to make a comment on, but I'm looking forward to a time that we can make more comments. And in fact, if we have some opportunity to improve it, great. But um, I would say before asking for more money for restorative justice programs from the city, um, I think what we can do is uh, we can ensure that it's part of the district improvement teams efforts in our improvement plan. We'll have some decisions we can make in the fall, in the spring, sorry, regarding um, where we're going to allocate our budget. Those are two opportunities for us to ensure that it becomes an instrumental and integral part of our district moving forward. And um, I would certainly love to know more about what we're doing outside of the code of conduct, because I truly believe that we have some administrators and staff now that are 100% supportive of it, and the momentum is moving in that direction. So. I'm quite happy about that. And um, if we get more money for it, great. But I, I, I'd also feel like we might all benefit from he hearing an update at some point about the efforts that we're making, and in particular, where the code of conduct is and when it will be put in place. So those are my responses to uh, Member Serafie Cox's questions. Uh, thank you, Member Busansky. Thanks. Um, at first, I really appreciated the letter from Real that Jenny Bender read during the um, public comment. I thought that really shed a lot of light on a subject that I already thought I knew about. So I appreciate that additional um, kind of those additional insights and information. And I'm and I'm glad to see that we don't have to make that decision about the SRO and the SRO has already been removed. I definitely feel positive about that. Um, I'm happy to consider a resolution. I agree that um, because it's non-binding, it's a little less, um, that maybe that it's a little less important than what member Fallon was saying about trying to maybe write a letter or in some way figure out what kind of advocacy we could do to support what's happening at the state level. But um, I'd be certainly uh, willing to consider it. Um, I guess uh, member Kaufman really, I agree with what he was saying about restorative justice programming and the code of conduct. And I think it's important for us to at least understand where we're at with that. I know that JFK has had some restorative justice program at the school there. 
Um, I think there's some kind of beginnings that we can build on and we don't have to think of it as something that we don't do at all. It's about how can we take what we do and build on it more. My understanding is the code of conduct was developed by a large group of um, key stakeholders. And so it's not that we haven't heard from the community. And I think maybe it's important for newer members to know that. And when there's eventually room on the agenda, I think it'd be really important to get an update on the code of conduct and on what restorative practices we already have in place and what we've already been doing so we can understand how we might want to move forward and, and also to get some feedback from that code of conduct team. So I just think it's important to recognize that we're not, um, that, that we're already into this to some degree and, and understand where we're at with it. So thanks. Um, Member Goldman. Oh, sorry. Member Goldman. Yep. Thank you. Um, Member Sarah Cox, thank you for in um, bringing this onto the agenda. Appreciate that. Um, and I, turns out, uh, really resonate with a lot of the items Member Buskansky said uh, regarding the resolution and also just sort of wondering like if, I'd be open to a resolution. And so the question is at another time, I'd like to be informed about who would write it, where the information would be collected. Would it be just from another district with our name stamped on top or would there be sort of, how would you verify the points of the resolution um, and who would be the people contributing to drafting it? So that's sort of wanting it to be really thoughtful and meaningful to have. Um, if that's the best way to go, or if it's better to put our energies into drafting letters for the state or something like that. Um, I also am curious if there are alternatives to restorative justice. Um, before last summer, I spoke with a number of people about the restorative justice practices that are happening in this district currently and um, concerns they have about it while at the same time really appreciating that they're being introduced. And so um, if we want to, if we believe that um, restorative justice practices and programs are aligned with our values and our, our work, then, and we want to sort of, I think it makes sense to build out or map out a robust program and then figure out you know, all of the components of that. What is the timeline? Who are the stakeholders? What are their contributions and concerns and questions? What are their needs? Um, who would be external contributors to it, internal contributors? What would the cost be and how would that affect our budget? Aligning it with the other values um, that we are funding. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Member Levy, I think you had your hand up and I may have lowered it by mistake um, at the end of that last round. So um, I'll yield to Member Levy first and then come to Member Sarah Cox. Thank you. Um, I, uh, Member Buskins, you said a lot of what I was going to say, and I apologize. I meant when I first spoke to, to reference the code of the new draft of the code of conduct and, and mentioned my excitement that that restorative practices um, seem to be central to that. Um, and I'm also looking forward to seeing um, that when it's when it's ready to be shared. Um, and just echo the point that I don't know who, uh, I don't know how many community members weighed in on it. I do know there was a very large committee that drafted it or is continuing to work on it. And so I do think that the community has had an opportunity to weigh in at least to a certain extent, but I do agree that community um, community conversation is really important. I just want to um, emphasize what um, Member Fallon said, which is that um, restorative practices is an initiative that's got to be well um, trained and well funded in order for it to, to be impactful. And so I want to make sure that, and, and I, I, I hear you, um, Member Kaufman, that, that maybe there's a conversation still coming about how we're allocating budget resources, but I don't recall seeing much in the budget conversation, at least that we were having earlier that mentioned supporting restorative practices. So that's where I'm coming from with 
a request from the city that given that it wasn't a part of the budget and given that it's a part of the code of conduct and given that I think there's a real um, desire from the community and I see the real benefit in it. I wanna make sure it's funded so that it can be um, really implemented well. And um, I think there are some ways of being able to use restorative justice language and do a few things here and there, but unless it's really a full-fledged program that, that teachers are really well-versed in, um, I'm not sure it's as effective as I'm hoping it to be. Member Serafi Cox. Yes, thank you. And thank you to the committee for this discussion. Um, I absolutely uh, support uh, what Member Fallon brought up about making a statement um, uh, about the, uh, the state law. I wonder then if, um, if something like that could be incorporated into the resolution. So it could be uh, a resolution uh, saying that we, you know, we have the intention. It's not about tying the hands because uh, as, as member Kaufman was concerned about um, and as, as other members pointed out, it's, uh, it's non-binding. So we're not actually tying the hands of future uh, school committees, uh, but we are um, making a statement about we have considered, uh, uh, you know, we're in this moment and, and we're making this statement now but that uh, a statement about that state law could be added to the resolution. Um, and, uh, and then uh, after that, it's a matter of organizing our, um, our public statements or you know, our advocacy to our state legislature uh, on that issue. Um, I think that, I think that uh, uh, the other thing that I'll say is I absolutely support uh, the idea of, of conversations with, uh, with both teachers and, uh, and students on this issue. The student union has been involved in some discussions around this. I uh, um, received communication from Eleanor um, um, after the last meeting about uh, the student union's interest in, uh, in this issue. Um, so I, I think that is ongoing, um, and uh, I think the I think the committee for kind of the direction that you have have given to to this issue and um, and can bring some things to the next uh, committee meeting. In answer to Member Goldman's question about how would it be drafted, of course, because of open meeting law, we can't draft it as as a group uh, in the same way that you might want to if you were working in a more informal committee. So, um, so that being said, you know, uh, perhaps the committee can, can ask two members of us to, to put something together to bring to the next meeting um, so that we're not violating open meeting law. Okay. Um, well, it sounds like you are already uh, uh, pledging to work on it from the beginning, Member Serapi Cox. I think Indeed. that would make, make you one of them. So if, if, you, if there's anyone else who wants to work with Member Serapi Cox on that, um, you can certainly contact her. Um, just make sure it's not a quorum of a subcommittee or a quorum of the school committee and shouldn't be a problem. Um, so I'll leave it to folks to reach out to you um, between now and July 9th. Um, Okay, so um, moving to the next item, item C on the agenda, we have a scheduled discussion and vote on NHS staffing, and we have Principal Valancourt here uh, to um, to discuss that issue. Principal Valancourt. Mayor? Oh, yes. Mayor, sorry to interrupt, but I, it might be convenient just to see if there's a motion to suspend the rules at this point rather than in the middle of Principal Valancourt's presentation. Certainly, thank you. Um, thank you for pointing that out, uh, Superintendent. Our rules do st uh, stipulate that if we go past 11, uh, it requires a vote of the school committee to suspend our rules. Um, so noting that it's 1055, I would entertain a motion. Um, Member Voss, are you raising your hand to make a motion or? I am. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm having internet issues. Um, I would like, to make a motion to suspend the rules through this agenda item and depend, and then we can suspend them again, depending on what time it is. That's my motion. 
Uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay. So the motion is to spend rules to allow for discussion of item C and then revisit at the conclusion of that discussion. Um, I'll, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll and uh, those supporting that should vote yes. Those opposed vote no. Member Gold. No. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. No. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. No. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Sure. Yes. Just, yes. <laughs> member Goldman. Yes. And Member Voss. Yes. Okay, rules are suspended, so uh, we will now. Uh, turn to Principal Ballancourt for the NHS staffing discussion. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, so many teachers um, spoke out this evening in regards to class sizes at the high school. And um, it is true that this year, not all students have been able to enroll for um, in courses of interest. And this has been um, something that we experience every year. For example, 41 students didn't get their request for a world language class. We have about 59 students who didn't get a social studies course request. Um, 30 were unable to enroll in a science class. 97 students were unable to take a preferred art course. And um, as much as I would love to hire four new teachers, and for full-time teachers, this is not a part of our budgeting reality. So I also recognize that the school committee worked hard to secure eight teachers in the English department. And at this time, 100% of Northampton High School students have been able to enroll in at least one English class. Um, and this is with seven current English teachers. We do have four students who were unable to enroll in a creative writing class. However, that is only because um, the course itself was under enrolled. And so we just shut down the class. There were only four total students interested in the course. Um, English class sizes right now for next year range between 14 to 22 students, the highest class being 22. And again, this is with 100% of students enrolled with seven teachers. If we hire an eighth teacher to replace Ms. Crago, we would have sizes ranging from eight to 20. Based on these numbers, I would like to reallocate this position and hire an additional teacher for the math department. Currently, the math department has nine teachers. Many students have chosen to enroll in a year long mathematics class as this was an option um, and request from many students and caregivers um, as an, for an attempt to catch up on learning loss resulting from the pandemic. This has resulted in our inability to fulfill all student requests. Um, we have 65 students who have been unable to take an advanced math class at Northampton High School and will be enrolling in AP Calc BC and AP Statistics at Greenfield Community College. We have also had to restrict students from doubling up in math this year. Typically about 100 students, potentially more, take two classes each year. For example, semester one, they may take IM1 and semester two, they'll take IM2. Um, math, class, math class sizes currently range from 19 and the highest being 29. So because I truly respect the input of the school committee and I have heard the request from the English department that maintaining the English position is important, I'm asking for your guidance on maintaining the current staffing numbers at eight in the English department 
or reallocating the position to the math department. Okay. Member Serafi Cox. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I'm I'm wondering if if things have changed since our budget conversation uh, in regard to the math numbers or the need in the math department has has that has that shifted since our last budget conversation. I don't remember there being a conversation about the math department at that time. No. So. Um, you're asking if the numbers in the math department have changed? Is that right? And I guess the deeper question is like, why? Um, I don't remember this being something that was identified during the budget process. So I'm just wondering if you can help me well, understand it why it's a right. priority now when it perhaps didn't seem to be before. But I, I don't know, maybe I'm just misunderstanding. So at that time, we didn't have concrete understanding of um, you know, what's being referred to as the COVID slide or the learning loss that has specifically impacted mathematics and students learning math remotely. And um, this is one of the reasons we have chosen to offer students a year-long year mathematics classes. Um, we have about 75, I can look at my numbers in a second, but we have quite a large number of students who have elected and their families have elected to take year-long maths, year-long math I am one, year-long mathematics for I am two, and year-long mathematics for three. Actually, every student coming into ninth grade is taking I am one as a year-long class. And this is because they have missed so much significant information um, in their eighth grade year. So they need to catch up on skills when they transition into high school. So because of that, we are unable to fulfill every single math request, um, you know, and so we tried to curb that by saying we won't have students double up. And even with not allowing students to double up in math this year, we are still short and unable to run the accelerated math classes. So it is an impact because of this COVID slide and our need to fulfill and make up lost learning. Um, uh, member Voss. Thank you. So, and thank you for all the data you shared and all the people that have reached out to talk to me about, um, uh, um, sorry, I thought I was muted, um, this situation. And I guess I just want to start by saying that it's really sobering to see how large our classes are across the majority of um, subjects at our high school. And as Principal Valancourt said, I think this is a moment where we really do need to realize that long-term planning, we need more Northampton High School teachers in these core areas in general, that the fact that I've talked to so many high school students and I, I really didn't understand the extent of this um, with, with classes 25, 30, 32 is, just not what Northampton education is about. And I think especially in the time of COVID when we might be doing a lot of remote and we need connections to students, it's even harder to have these big classes. Um, I feel like there's two things going on. Well, there's a lot of things going on, but two things that I just wanna talk about. Um, one is the future of English language arts in Northampton High School and what it really should be staffed at and the other is next year. And I, I think maybe if I separate those a little bit, it helps um, me with my thoughts. So next year, I'll start with next year. Next year is really different, as you've said, although I think I might say it differently, Ms. Valancourt, but please correct me if I'm wrong. I think most students have been really encouraged to take a year long of math, not necessarily as much of an option. I mean, maybe there's an option, but is that not true? We're really encouraging them to take a year of math, right? We are not encouraged. We have encouraged all uh, new students, um, new ninth grade students to yeah. take year long math. However, it's not necessarily been encouraged for I am two or I am three. That has strictly been optional. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and. And this makes a lot of sense because a lot of these kids missed half of a, the high school 
kids missed half of a year of math this past year and JFK kids missed a lot of math. So there's real reason behind that. And I think as a committee, we need to acknowledge that and say, are there resources that are needed to make up for some of that learning loss? Um, what I'm not hearing, and I guess I'd like more information on is the kids that missed half the year of English. And I have actually heard from more parents with concerns about that than, than I have in math. And I'm not saying that it's a bigger concern, one's a bigger issue than the other. I'm just sharing that they're both concerns for me. And I'm worried about large English classes next year that are not full year and making sure students continue to get what they need um, in terms of writing skills. And um, so that's where I'm at with this. I, I absolutely see why we need another math teacher. There's no doubt about it, looking at the numbers for, for that. I, I do, what I don't understand is if, well, we need another math teacher. We probably need more than one math teacher. So then the longer term question I have in terms of English is, um, I'm really, I don't, I don't think seven English teachers is enough in the long term. Um, and some numbers I'll share is that that's the one class that our students have to take every single year, state mandated. You have to have four years of English. And as we all got letters several months ago, um, within five or six years ago our, in Northampton, we required all our students to take five courses taught mostly by English teachers. So four English classes and a writing class. And my understanding is that when the transition was made to remove the requirement for that fifth class or writing class, there was a commitment made to keeping English classes to 18 or less so that students got really a lot of feedback on their writing, which arguably is one of the most important skills they'll take to whatever career they end up in. And so when I look at the spreadsheets and it says the class size is limited to 25, I don't know the process for that going from 18 to 25. And I'm not trying to pit one need against the other. I just, I'm really concerned that these numbers are much bigger than they should be. And my final little bit of research and comparison is if you look at the DESE website, Amherst last year had 10 full-time English teachers for 920 students and Northampton had eight and now possibly going down to seven for 870 students. And this is assuming our students only take one English class. This is not um, in an environment where we can offer extra English classes for them to choose to take in the same way that we seem to be offering extra classes in other subjects. Um, so those are my concerns. I'd love to hear your thoughts on them, but I think moving forward, I really would like us to find money. And I know that's hard right now, but to think creatively about not cutting the English teacher and what can we do to have another math teacher next year? So I, Am I, are you wanting a response to that or is that just coming? If, if you want, if there's something I said that you feel like I got wrong or that you have comments, I, I, feel free to respond. I do have, yeah, I do think I have a little insight into that. So I'd like to point out also first that currently the average class, the highest um, number of students in a class right now is 22 and the lowest is seven, uh, 14. So, um, you know, 18 would be a lovely number. And um, unfortunately, it's not where we are. We're at, you know, 22 is the highest, but I think it's pretty reasonable when we compare that number to um, other departments. And in regards to skills and learning loss, I think it's important to point out that the literacy standards and the English standards are spread throughout a number of different departments. So those are the standards that students are able to access throughout their day. For example, in their social studies or history classes, they're doing their research paper and they're utilizing the exact same standards that they may be using um, in their English classes. So the ability to persuade and to choose an audience and to be able to listen and, and speak and all of these these standards are the same um, also used in their science classes or many of their other elective classes so those standards are pretty common and typical throughout each um, 
throughout each, um, you know, a number of different departments. Uh, I also want to point out that I do think it's, um, it is a little heart-wrenching that more students aren't interested in English electives. I think I can definitely do and I couldn't do that work with the English department this year, but I do think that there's some work to be done for recruiting and um, making these classes a little bit more um, engaging for students and figuring out ways in which we can promote the English classes, specifically the electives. It is not for the lack of effort or the lack of electives in the English class, but students aren't signing up for them. They are signing up for many of, or trying to enroll or register for many of our STEM classes. And as much as we want Northampton to be, you know, a liberal arts school and to, and as much as we all value the arts and, um, um, you know, including, which I include the English department in, you know, students don't seem to be um, flocking to these particular courses right now. We, our enrollment in our science classes and in our, um, in our mathematics classes just happen to be of more interest right now for students. And so I think that, you know, it ebbs and flows with where students are interested, but right now it seems to be the STEM field. Um, and again, that doesn't mean I can't work with the English department um, to create more classes that are just more enticing for the young people in our school. Can I just, a quick follow-up, just really in terms of many people have reached out to me about this. There's a clear plan for the learning loss in math, and it's to take a full year, to take a full year, essentially have two, ver two classes. What is the plan for learning loss in English? So with math, the only time to get mathematics for those standards is in their mathematics class. Like I said, the literacy standards and the reading standards are seen throughout di many different subject areas so they can be covered. Um, every teacher coming back has been asked to think about how, the, how they're going to um, assess their, or do some pre-assessment with their students and they will use that data and information to plan and see where students are in their learning and be able to pick them up um, throughout the, the remainder of the semester. The standards for 9-10 are pretty repetitive and then the standards for 11 and 12 are pretty repetitive. So they get to repeat many of those standards in over the course of their English one and English two years. Thanks. Member Kaufman. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Principal Valancourt. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, well, let me begin by asking the, um, you know, we certainly, I think you're probably aware, we've certainly as a school committee have received a, a whole bunch of uh, information over the last week um, regarding this issue. And it does seem to be a pretty divisive issue within the school. So I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, one of my questions is to whom else, um, and I understand what you're trying to do. I see it as not a cut of the English department. I see it as a redistribution of your available resources, but maybe that's semantics. Maybe that's the way you present it. Other people see it differently and I respect that as well. But I'm just wondering um, who else have you shared this with at the school to come up with this idea? Um, your vice principals, the English department, your school council, um, your full faculty, Anybody that you can just mention would be helpful for me to know who, who was involved in this, at least your, your proposal. Sure, so um, yeah, and I think you're right. I have not been using the word cut, but I can understand how that, it, it may be semantics and people may hear cut. And um, you know, I have apologized for those who have interpreted that it that way, but you're right that it is a redistribution of staffing. Um, the planning has really happened with, so the planning um, needs to happen once the schedule is built. A lot of that happens in partnership with our school counseling department. Uh, the department chair and I have been working um, pretty, you know, daily over 
the last week building the schedule. We typically have our schedule built by April. So we have a lot of these answers and we, we know what teachers will be teaching by now and what student classes students need and what they're registering for. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that. Um, so at the same, with the same, in the same timeline. Um, but I have shared that with the department chair and we have looked at the numbers to determine what our biggest needs are. The and I have also the guidance department. Okay. I have, um, I've also sent out all of these numbers and all of the, the forms that you have seen and the breakdowns in the class size. I've also shared that with the entire um, faculty at large and the department chairs who've been able to look at it Every year I give the, the department chairs a list of the total requests for each class, the max enrollment, and um, I ask them to determine how many, I give them a suggested number of sections and I ask them to determine uh, which teachers will teach each class and which sections should run. And that is the responsibility of the department chair to figure that out. Yeah. And so um, department chairs have definitely been a part of the process. So English doesn't have a department chair right now. We are in flux, but I did share it with the um, entire department. And again, when other departments see this and when the counseling department takes a look at it, it's really about what our need is. And when we see we have, you know, math classes at 30 and world language classes at 33, we really have to consider where um, another teacher would be more um, useful or helpful or um, needed. Okay, and um, I don't know, I, I know you're relatively new, but now you're in do you have an active school council? And um, would you describe your work with the school council as active? And did you have an opportunity to share this idea? I know you asked us for some feedback tonight. I'm wondering if you also gathered that from the school council and what they said, if you recall, if you did that. I. You know, the school council and I had our, our final meeting, uh, you know, at the end of earlier, I don't know, at the end of, um, at the end of May. And so this was not, this, the schedule was not even on our radar then, nor did we have the numbers, nor did we have the enrollment, so, um, or the request. So I did not share it with the school council. It is something that I could do. I could ask for their feedback. Um, the reason I'm bringing up, in, to the school committee is because I know it was really important to the school committee to um, be able to maintain the eight staff, the number of eight for the English department, having eight teachers in the English department. And I don't want to make that change it change without your, um, you know, your guidance or your suggestion. I think it's yeah. important. One thing that I have a question then maybe for um, Dr. Provost or uh, Chairman Narkowitz is when we decided on this agenda item, we had decided it was the discussion and a vote. Um, did that change? Did we make a mistake or did that change? Are we voting on something tonight? It doesn't sound like that's what Principal Valancourt is asking for. So, uh, but that's what the agenda says. Do you have any recollection of where we I are? Think we put, I think we put it as a vote just in case there was some desire to take a vote. And so like if the count, council wanted to make some affirmative statement by way of a vote, yeah. Uh, so we just didn't want to foreclose that as an option. So okay. I think that's how it was structured. Is that the way you remember, Dr. Prova? Or yes, exactly. Okay. So with that said, since I don't need to take a vote, I, I can share my opinion on this. First of all, um, I, I don't think if we were taking a vote, I, I would be um, I would be pretty uncomfortable with that because I, I do think that it's very fair for Principal Valancourt to any time or any principal to ask us our opinion. I don't, um, I, I would hope and feel that the opinion is drawn out or the ideas are fleshed out in, within a school in a positive school culture, which to me, I'm a little concerned with, despite getting a lot of feedback on this, um, it's very clear that there's a level of distrust that needs to be addressed at the school. Um, I, I would think that's, that, that's not a surprise, but I would appreciate in the future trying to get uh, input from the school faculty and the school council um, before coming to us. That said, I don't think as mass ed reform, um, I think purposely wanted to pull us out of these situations. If we were taking a vote tonight, I would, I would object to that. 
because I just don't think it's legal. I don't think we we oversee um, this level of discourse or this level of decision making. I think that's fully under the authority of the principal. Um, and if Principal Valancourt decides for whatever reason she wants to to make this decision, I think this is her authority. And in fact, I don't even think Dr. Provost has a say in it. I, I might stand corrected, but I'm virtually positive that we have no say in it. Um, what complicates this situation is that when we were when this was brought to our attention initially, it was part of our budget discussion. And I feel like um, we made a decision on the budget based on the based on the um, understanding that, that there would be eight English teachers. And that's my only hang up. If, if that wasn't the issue, then I would say certainly Principal Valancourt, here's my ideas, this is what I think. Frankly, I think you've made a smart decision. I think you've looked at the numbers, I appreciate it. And I think you're doing what's best for kids. I have no objection at all to what you're proposing, but I do feel like there's this, this secondary thing that we made a decision based on the budget. Um, the fact that you're not coming to us as a budgetary item, but strictly asking us for our feedback, I guess that takes away my challenge as to whether we have a say or not. So unless my colleagues feel adamant that we need to retain this position because that's how we, this is where we were last April when we made a decision around the budget, this no longer feels like a budget item to me. And you're asking for our feedback and I say that it's your authority to make this decision and I hopefully you can um, make some positive inroads with some of the staff at the high school that feel like they're, that this is the wrong decision because it concerns me more than anything that this is gonna adversely impact the school culture moving forward. Um, so it's your decision, I'll stand by your decision. I think it's the right decision based on all the information I received, um, but I would also encourage you to address the downside of making this decision if this is how you um, decide to pursue it. Thank you. You're welcome. Member Levy. Uh, Member Kaufman just said a lot of what I was gonna say, um, except for the thinking that this is necessarily the right decision. I'm not sure I know that or understand that. And I agree that you, Principal Valancourt, are much better positioned to be able to make that determination. I second his notion that I really am concerned about the climate and the mistrust and the seemingly, um, you know, sounds like every department got to weigh in about sections except the English department. Um, that troubles me. And I think I see where folks are coming from in terms of, um, in terms of their, uh, their feeling upset about this, this potential decision. I also agree with member Kaufman that this was a decision that, that we did make from a budgetary standpoint of, com of really committing to eight English teachers. Um, and that is something that that I still feel strongly is is um, is is a part of of what I would hope would be moving forward. I also will share what Member Voss says that I'm incredibly dismayed to see these numbers in general, and I am not sure what we should be spending money on at the high school if not more teachers uh, for these classes to bring the class sizes dramatically down. Um, so I do hope that that's going to be a part of our conversation for the budget moving forward. I guess the other thing that I, I want to bring up, and I don't know if this is appropriate or not, is to say when we make staffing choices about hiring and not, not filling positions, those are long-term decisions. And it sounds like, and I don't, I guess this is more of a question, um, it sounds like the increase in math numbers is a short-term COVID related issue. Um, it sounds like the, the numbers were likely too high anyway, and we need a new, another math teacher regardless or more, um, just like we need more social studies and more Spanish and so on. Um, and uh, I guess my question is, does it make sense to make a long-term decision for what's potentially a short-term need? I think you answered that where the numbers are always high. And, you know, if you look back at the, the history of the class sizes in, um, in mathematics, you'll see that those cal the calculus classes are pushing 32, the AP stats class is the same 35. Um, the class averages are very, very high. And again, students are doubling up in math. 
And, um, you know, we have, we, if it, if it wasn't for um, our partnership with GCC right now, we would have over a hundred students who have been unable to get requests in mathematics. And for English, it's four. And I don't think that this is a response to um, just a short-term situation. I think, you know, we used to have a, um, a computer science teacher who was affiliated with the mathematics department who no longer is there. Um, Kevin Lucy is now his own entity of in the um, technology department. So that was one loss and we were, were never able to um, refill that. And I think, um, Dina, that you're correct in that we just do need more teachers and it always is um, a long-term, you know, it's, it, it's a long, the fix becomes long-term. And if we hire a math teacher, that's um, for the long-term. And the question is how will the English numbers be for, you know, in the future, all of that's a question. And I don't have the answers right now because student interests change all the time. And like I mentioned, the ebbs and flows of student interest. And right now it's in mathematics. Um, at other times it's in English. And sometimes it depends on teachers and sometimes it depends on subject and there's all kinds of variables, but this is just where we are now. Yeah, I guess the, the thing that's hard to reconcile for me is the statements from students about not being able to see the board and being in overcrowded classrooms for English. And that's where I guess it's it's I, I it's not that I'm questioning your numbers. I they I, I appreciate as Member Voss said the um your your the the homework that you did to share those numbers with us to get give us a much better clearer sense of of the the differences. Um, oh. You're always welcome. Like you're welcome to come to the high school and see and look at English classes. Um, there have been times where the numbers have been really high. But um, that has not been the case for a while. And some of the AP classes have been high. And a lot of that is because we haven't had teachers trained to teach the AP class. But fortunately this summer, I'm able to send two of the teachers in the English department to be trained in AP language and AP literature. So I think that gives an opportunity for us to spread those classes out a little bit more and to get the class sizes down, which was one of my goals. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, I do agree that there, you know, there was, there is some repair that needs to happen with the English department when we were last uh, having a conversation about the budget and we were, and I did propose that we cut an English posi position. Um, I, you know, there was some disappointment and um, some upset within the English department and I've been working to repair that relationship, but I, I do not think um, the, and I will continue to work on that relationship, but I do want to point out, you had said that the English department didn't see these numbers or have an opportunity to weigh in. Sue Crago was able to determine how many sections were needed and which teachers would teach which class without her being in the schedule. So she did do that before um, she stopped before she 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 parted ways, um, and the entire the entire English department was also able to see these numbers and the uh, layouts, and they were able to share who would teach what. I had an, a conversation just this week with Mr. Selfridge regarding you know his interest in teaching more AP classes and sharing that that load with Carl Mead and who would teach what. Teachers can always choose what they're gonna to wanna to teach and they do that work with, the, with their department chair. So I just want you to know that they did have um, they did have a voice in the schedule. And I also want you to know that I, I recognize I have work to do to repair my relationship with the English department. And I do believe that the morale at the high school is actually better than it has been in quite a while. And I've, you know, I would ask you to speak with all departments. I don't think that um, the voice of a few um, really represents the, the nature of what's happening with the faculty and staff at the high school. Yeah, that's fair. I was really referring to the English department and I do apologize if I misunderstood your previous comments about, about department chairs weighing in. Thanks. Um, before I go to member Gold, Dr. Provost, do you have your hand up? Did you want to add something to one of the current or previous questions? Yes, I just wanted to offer some historical context 
um, for new members of the committee. Uh, I believe that the issue of staffing in the math department is longstanding. FY20 was one of the many years that I presented multiple budgets, and I initially had proposed an additional math teacher in that budget. Unfortunately, um, when the budget had to be redone in order to create more money for negotiations, that position came out. But I do think that um, we've seen a long-standing need for additional math teachers at the high school. Uh, thank you for that um, historical perspective. Um, Member Gold, you have the next hand. Uh, yeah. I just wanted, because Principal Valancourt was asking for guidance from the school committee, I just want to let you know I do support uh, your decision making in, in this and uh, appreciate what seems like a really thorough process and, and it's been inclusive and you know I know it's you know there's no way ever to make everybody happy on things like this but it seems like you're making uh, what's in the best interest of the students and I appreciate that and uh, so yeah if you're looking for guidance I would support your authority and your decision making on this so thank you. Thanks. Member Bisansky. Thanks. Um, I do appreciate all the information you provided with uh, us with Principal Valancourt. I'm just, uh, but I'm curious um, if Sue Crago hadn't left the English department, what would you have done? If Sue Crago did not leave the English department, then the position would have stayed as is. And so you would have continued to have eight English teachers for next year. I would have continued to have eight English teachers and the class sizes would have ranged between eight and 20. And um, I would be doing, you know, I would still be contracting with GCC out for mathematics classes and I would be turning students away from these, from their, the classes that they had registered for. Okay, and so, and the GCC classes, that's not filling the need for the AP calculus or AP stats or other higher level math classes. Isn't that what the, or is that what the GC classes, GCC classes are for? Um, no, we typically have dual enrollment classes, but what we, we typically allow students to participate in dual enrollment classes, but we offer the AP, um, we offer AP Calculus BC in our school, and we also offer AP Statistics in our school, but those teachers are going to be teaching other mathematics classes, and so we have to contract out to get those classes to be able to be taught. Um, students will have an opportunity to take the AP test, and they will also be able to earn college credit in the classes. This um, isn't typically available to students because we have teachers in-house teaching it. Got it. And I mean, I agree with my other colleagues that, you know, it's looking at those numbers of, you know, the class sizes and even my, you know, own experience of my children, it's definitely, you know, something that we have to work on moving forward. But, um, but I also, I do feel disturbed that we had a really um, full and robust budgetary discussion about the English teacher and we worked really hard and stayed up really late to figure out how to keep eight English teachers and now to have this change because um, Ms. Crago, uh, you know, is leaving the high school. So um, it, it leaves me just kind of concerned um, about the budget process and the school committee role. And it just kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth that we're sitting here having this conversation again at 11.30 at night. I, I think we, uh, you know, went through all, even at that time, we were already, you know, in this school shutdown and the pandemic. And I just feel like we recognize the importance of having, um, you know, English is a real kind of core competency. Um, so uh, I realize we're not taking a vote on it, but I do feel, um, uh, yeah, I really feel concerned. And I think this is kind of, we're facing a unique one year situation. And once we cut this English department teacher, we're probably never gonna see this English department uh, grow in size again. And that's so just concerning to me. I want to point out that at the time when we were asked to make cuts in the budget, I had chosen to cut an English position because I knew the class sizes with eight were going to be um, incredibly small. And I also had insight at that time, which, um, which 
I know that many of you didn't agree with, but I knew that um, Mr. Isler was not going to be um, teaching English in the academy. I knew that um, I knew that we would not be having the capstone be a part of the English department anymore. And so I knew going in that we would have a number of sections in the English department that were going to be um, were going to be freed up so teachers would have more ability to teach more classes. And so I, you know, I tried to explain that at that time that this, that the numbers were going to be very low because we wouldn't need the English teachers to cover these particular positions any longer. And um, that's why I had suggested that we cut that position. So it wasn't, it wasn't a personal decision by any means. It was really, when we look at the budget, it was really about figuring out where, um, you know, what my, what my needs were. And I knew that that would be a position that I could afford to cut if necessary. And I am so very, you know, as sad as I am to see Sue Crago leave uh, Northampton High School, I'm happy she has an administrative position somewhere else. And I'm also so happy that um, we didn't have to cut anybody from the English department because the last thing I wanna do is cut staffing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, member Voss, and um, I guess uh, Member Voss, the Member Kaufman, and then I think I just I want to understand what the committee wants to do with in regard to this item. Whether um, it's, I'm, I'm beginning to believe that the committee is not going to take an affirmative vote; they're just giving the feedback that the principal asked for. Um, but I just trying to be mindful of the time because um, we do have other items on the agenda. So, Member Voss. Hi. Member Busansky really expressed where I'm at with this too. I, I want to recognize, I realize there's a lot of need at the high school. I also continue to be really concerned just about how this decision was made and the effect, the long-term effect of the decision. And to, I guess, leave a few thoughts, which include, I, I worry when we talk about, you know, um, the uh, these different sizes of classes, because somewhere along the way we're making this decision right now that says we used to have smaller English classes and now this spreadsheet says it's limited to 25 when decisions were made before where the classes were more like 18 and just if you do the math if we look at averages which is probably not the right way to look at it but they average if they if each student takes one English class they average 15 kids per class with seven English teachers, we're gonna average at least 21 kids per class. And with eight, we would average 18. And that's assuming there's just one English class per student. So I guess I wanna leave us in a place to come back to when we talk about the budget to really come back to this question. Um, I think our community needs better numbers in terms of our English instruction and um, I guess I would ask you if you would think about, well, well, two things. One, if we only have seven teachers, how are we ever going to ever offer classes that are electives that are going to get students excited to take more English? Because there's not going to be space for any of those. That's one thing I just will leave you with. I don't need an answer, but I really hope we think about it. And the other is, if you have a commitment to reinstate this English teacher as soon as possible. And um, I'll also put a little feeler out there, which I've long thought part of the reason um, we have so high enrollments in math is we don't expect enough of some of our, we don't give our students a chance in middle school to um, excel in the same way a lot of other districts do. So the fact that students can't skip integrated math one in high school means they have to take a whole nother math class. And that's costly in terms of the amount of teacher time that's required. And so this is obviously a bigger conversation, but I think these things should all be part of it moving forward so that our students have an Amherst-like English experience. Thank you, Member Voss. And I really look forward to the school committee supporting any budget choices that come about in regards to 
increasing my staffing numbers, specifically in English and world language in social studies and science. So I don't see any other hands. So <clears throat> I'm assuming that we're, we've um, fully discussed this and given uh, Principal Valancourt our thoughts and we appreciate her coming to us given the very specific nature of, um, of what she's proposing and we appreciate your coming back to us about that. And um, so I think we would now um, be prepared to move on um, not to item D, item D actually has been withdrawn. So we've already made progress there. So we're actually looking to get to item E, um, but I will need a, um, a motion to um, extend the meeting again um, based on the prior uh, motion. Is there a motion to extend the meeting? Okay, wow. The chair would, uh, I, I don't usually make motions. How about so for the moved. purposes of discussion? <laughs> okay, member, member Goldman has made a motion for the purposes of discussion. Let's see if she can muster a second. Is there a second? Hmm. Okay, well. Second. Second from member Fallon. So again, like, um, you know, I will tell you that the, you know, school committee has charged the, um, the agenda setting team to make these meetings end uh, shorter and we get lots of items that get added to us. Often in the last 24 hours, we get items that are critical that must be added and we add them. Um, but we seem to find ourselves um, always up against time constraints. So um, we, to the extent that we can't take them up tonight, we have to kick them to a future meeting. So they're just gonna pile up and pile up. So. I'm not sure it's more of a comment. Um, I don't know how we uh, rein ourselves in on some of these items and not take as long, but that's, it is what it is, but here we are at 1142. So there's been a motion made and seconded to um, extend, uh, to waive our rules and extend the time past 11 again. Um, any further discussion? Okay, I'll ask the clerk. Yep, no, I have my hand up. Oh, oh, go ahead, Member Voss. Um, I would entertain the, a discussion or a, a friendly amendment, whatever, however I want to do it. Of we have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow that um, is scheduled for quite a long time. I'm not sure if I know why. Um, and I would make a motion that we continue then. Or <laughs> I don't make think a suggestion. Can. I don't think we can if. Can we? Yeah, the, the challenge is that that's a posted meeting that we've only, we, there's only one I, item on that agenda. So I don't think we can, I don't think we can just transform these items to another, to another agenda that hasn't been properly posted. I'm the least expert on the policy and anyone who knows it better can weigh in. But I think if we don't finish our meeting, it says we have to finish it in a certain amount of time. And I guess I was pointing to tomorrow since we could end that meeting and take it up since we already have an agenda, but I don't know how that works. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know that we can continue these items. Um, I just don't know that we can continue these items to tomorrow night when tomorrow night has already been posted and there's the public would not expect these items to show up on that agenda. Um, so we would really need to repost that we really need to go to the ninth. So we really can't continue these items to tomorrow night. Member Fallon, you have your hand up. You know what? I could get through my items fairly quickly if we didn't waste time talking in circles. Well, we could, yeah, we could take the, it seems like the resolutions could be taken as a group, fr frankly. I mean, you could explain them all and they could be voted on as a group. Um, so, um, but we have to, first we have to get through the rules. Uh, Member Bysansky, did you have a question? I, I was gonna say a similar thing. It seems like the next couple items we could get through pretty fast and I'd really like to, yep. um, at, you know, at least at the risk of really alienating member Fallon, at least get through letter H. I don't wanna push rules and policy off, I swear, but I, I don't know, that's- Member Gold. 
Um, yeah, I'd like to ask if we can, in, I guess, part of the discussion, can we have a, a separate meeting to continue these on the 7th or 8th next week? Um, because I think looking at the readings of the, um, just when I'm looking down the list, like we want to talk about them. We want, or not, to, there's things to discuss and to really read through and make sure what we're voting on. And I just don't see that we can do that tonight. And, you know, for what it's worth, I just want to throw it out there. Like it's 1145 and we spoke the most. I got to just, you know, like we got to, that's part of one of our things in our agenda is like being cognizant of how much we are talking and I'm doing it right now and breaking it. But like, when we add up all the time, the school committee is the one who's been talking the most there. And if we add up all that time and we subtract an hour and a half, we'd at least be at 10.15 right now. So I really hope we hold ourselves accountable for our airtime and I would, and not to keep us all here. So I would motion to do a meeting on the 7th or 8th or something like that. Um, um, so we have a meeting on the 9th already scheduled. So um, I guess, I guess could we extend and then see how far we get and then we can push other items to that other meeting if we have to. Um, well, so we can't have an, an additional meeting. We can't do another special meeting on the 7th or 8th in addition to the 9th and to get this done. Uh, we can, um, we certainly can, uh, but I, I guess I- Yeah, yeah. whatever we need to do. I can I make a motion to extend till midnight and then we, it ends? Uh, like okay, well, what there, if we don't there, get to? With the- um, I'll accept that friendly amendment. Okay, so Member Goldman is accepting that friendly amendment that we uh, turn into a pumpkin at midnight. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on that so so we can get the vote in before midnight and um, <laughs> try it out. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Yeah. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. And Member Gold? No. <laughs> hey, Member Fallon, uh, you have the floor. Um, Mr. Winnie has, has um, uh, rescinded his request to rescind his re retirement, so we're not, we're not doing item D. So you have the floor to discuss these three MASC resolutions. Okay, so well, the first uh, resolution is the COVID-19 state funding resolution. Um, the day after the commissioner came out with his initial guidance requiring districts to have uh, a certain level of uh, personal protective equipment uh, for schools, um, Nerissa Wallen from Triton Regional School District and Peter Demling from Amherst School Committee um, got together with a few other colleagues and crafted this resolution. As of this afternoon, it's been passed by 105 other school committees already. Um, and it's been instrumental, I think, in already putting some pressure on the commissioner for offering some sort of relief um, in his opening guidance to districts. Um, we're hoping to get um, full um, reimbursement. Um, and so I'm not gonna read the entire um, resolution for you, but it's essentially stating that there can be no unfunded mandates for COVID-19. Um, and so I would move to um, support this resolution. Is there I'll a second? second. Okay. Um, any discussion on this uh, resolution? Okay, hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. And Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. 
Thank you. Um, the second resolution is um, a school committee anti-racism resolution. It was introduced by um, initially by school committee member um, Denise Hurst from Springfield. Um, she is also serving currently as the vice president of the MASC. Um, and just to, so that you know, all three of these resolutions um, came before me last week. I serve on the resolutions committee for the MASC and all three were approved. Um, I will tell you this resolution met the most um, resistance from committee members and I fought pretty hard to have it uh, brought push forward in this form. There was a significant effort to water it down, but um, it went through uh, essentially largely untouched with just a few typos fixed up. Um, so I would move to have this uh, to support this resolution um, as it's presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Uh, Member Levy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I do, thanks. Um, so I hear you that, that that it could have been more watered down. I would actually, I don't know if we're allowed to like amend it if it's a resolution that comes from MASC. I would actually like to make it a little bit stronger and I would offer up um, one more whereas. Um, which is um, something along the lines of, whereas all students at every grade should be taught developmentally appropriate curricula um, that, that centers identity, equity, and inclusion. Something about, um, about cause it, it very nicely touches a lot of aspects, but it doesn't actually talk about the student experience and what they're learning. And I think that's a really essential piece that's missing. Um, so in the interest of time, why don't you, why don't we you work on that and bring it to us for the July 9th meeting the wording that you would like to see in it I'm you can absolutely change it um like I said this was problematic I know Agawam only passed it in a very watered down version um I think uh Newton made some changes to it in a different direction and so we can absolutely make changes to this but I think that right now is not the time to try and like wordsmith it too much so I'm yeah. happy to to, to move this to the next month's, to the July 9th agenda? Well, I just put my words in the chat and I don't I don't need to have a long conversation about it unless people want to. Um, How does that look? Do you see that? Um, do, that centers includes? Do, sorry, that centers. Get it, get okay. Rid. Okay. So does that work? Um, and did you have a particular place you wanted that? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere in there. And you'll accept that as a friendly amendment so we don't have to vote on the amendment? Absolutely. Okay. Are you okay with that, Member Levy? Okay, great. Just mindful of a roll call vote. Um, okay. Uh, member Gold. Yeah, do we not have something like this already in our documents at all? I mean, it seems like it's something I've seen, I feel like in other, whether it's school improvement plans or district improvement plans or something like, do we not have something along these lines already? So this one was more for advocacy, so our support as the MASC organization, like this, this particular one, the MASC resolutions are going to be put forth before the delegate assembly. So we were trying to already show, um, show support that's already kind of this upswelling of support um, already um, be in, in advance of that meeting in addition to that, but we are working on um, adopting the policy that was referred to us last month this, the, sorry, it is so late, I can't even think straight. Um, we had the anti-racism and equity policies that we had referred to us at the last school committee meeting, um, was referred to the rules and policy subcommittee that we're working on over this summer. Okay. So I think that's what you're thinking of. And Member Gold, I'll just share that I've asked to be on our next agenda a conversation about what's happening currently in the district in terms of anti-racism to get a better sense of 
what's happening and, and whether there's necessary steps for us to take as a school committee to make some kind of resolution like in, along those lines. Okay, any further questions or friendly amendments related to the anti-racism resolution? Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. And Member Busanski? Yes. Okay. Um, this next uh, resolution was brought to us by, um, uh, I was approached by Noah Cassis from the Northampton um, Mayor's Youth Commission. Um, if you all recall last year, the um, Charter Review Committee met um, to offer recommendations. Um, and one of the recommendations that they were offering was that 16 and 17 year olds be allowed to vote moving forward um, in Northampton. Obviously that would require uh, the approval of the legislature due to the pandemic. Um, those recommendations aren't even before the legislature currently, um, but I know that um, Mr. Cassis was hoping to gather sort of a coalition of support in the meantime, so that at that time when it does go before the legislature, he could say that uh, he has the support of his community. Um, and so the city council has already passed a resolution. Um, he's gotten the support of the Northampton Deputy. Democratic City Committee, and he's asking us to support this resolution to lower the voting age for Northampton municipal um, elections to 16 years old. And I won't read the resolution, um, but I will move that we support the resolution. Um, Second. The, the, sorry. <laughs> so it's um, motion has been made by Member Fallon and seconded by Member Goldman. Is there any discussion on this? This has um, received a lot of uh, conversation in our community and has had votes of other bodies as uh, member Fallon has pointed out. Um, okay, all right then. So um, I'll ask the clerk to call Mayor, the I th I member think Kaufman. One, oh, one sorry one. about that, member Kaufman, sorry. No problem, uh, just a quick question to member Fallon. So what happens after this? This uh, what, what function does this serve in the big picture and what is the big picture? How does this actually get passed? So there are two things that are going on. Um, one is our individual city charter and the mayor can correct me if I'm wrong. So the city charter is a uh, mass general law in and of itself. It's a, it's a statute. And so that would go before the legislature and theoretically they could approve um, our, our um, charter and these changes um, that are substantive enough to require them to uh, to approve both the Senate and the House these changes. But con conversely, there's also a pretty big push um, at the state level to just allow uh, for local decision making um, in this in this process as far as um, letting municipalities decide whether or not 16 or 17 year olds have the vote. And so um, I don't know which will happen first. Yeah. I don't know, but the, the process, both processes are pretty long and obviously everybody's a little distracted right now. And so is there a chance that Northampton can gain approval and not other municipalities unless they apply? Like could, could the secretary, secretary of state approve it in one oh. town and city and not the rest of the state? It was my understanding. I thought Arlington had. Mayor. Yeah, there's a bunch of them that have that have requested it. Not, the legislature has yet to grant one yet. So, okay. Uh, yeah. So, so we're oh, supporting oh, us. yeah. I think what drove this is that I thought that they approached. Didn't they approach the MASC? And the Initi MASC yes. said it would only support it if some school committee somewhere sponsored a resolution. So that's why they wanted our school committee to sponsor a resolution. Yeah, so it had local support. So now we did we did vote on and, and it did pass um, a, a statewide resolution. Not not saying that we support Northampton's application, but saying that we support in general the sixteen year old the the local dis, that local uh, municipalities should have should be able to make that decision on their own. 
Okay, so this this could really drive a statewide process forward. And um, I just wanted to thank you for bringing these three resolutions to us tonight. It's too bad we need to rush through them. They're actually a lot to be proud of here, but um, well, I don't know how this vote's gonna go, but assuming mm -hmm. it goes in a positive way, I wanna thank you for bringing that. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask the clerk to call the roll because it's 1159. <laughs> Me Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. And Member Fallon? Yes. Okay, so that's three resolutions, uh, all adopted um, in seven minutes, and it's 12 midnight. Um, so our motion to extend has expired. Um, so uh, I guess the question before the committee is we have item H, and then we have item I. Um, and so the question be and becomes, and item I, of course, is the infamous agenda format, which we've been trying to talk about for many, 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 many months, but we can't seem to get to. Um, so those could be put off, that could be taken up tonight or put off to a future meeting, but it will require a motion to suspend rules further in order to do that. Is there a motion to suspend rules? Member Levy, is that a motion? Oh. No, it's a request that we put that item first on our agenda for our next meeting. Okay. Yes, please. So start with those items, items H and I as the first items on our, well, after the ratification vote. Oh, no, I mean, I'm talking about July 9th. So, okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. Um, Okay, so it sounds like there's not going to be a motion to extend the meeting. Um, so I guess we will, um, I don't know if I should just call it as an adjournment because we, our rules forced us to adjourn, um, or if we have to take an affirmative vote, vote to adjourn. Parliamentarian, what say ye? <laughs> All right. To be safe, let's take the vote. I, I think that's a good, I think just, yeah. Um, belts and suspenders, as they say in legal. Let's take a vote just to be safe. Um, so, is there a motion to adjourn? I, I was going to make a motion to adjourn and do what okay. Member Fallon asked of the agenda. Okay, fine. Member, uh, is there a second? Second. second? Okay. So, we'll add these items up front at the next meeting on July 9th. Um, okay, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Mayor Narkowitz? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. And Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Okay, I believe that uh, is a majority. So the meeting of the Northampton School Committee for June 29th is duly adjourned at 12.03 on June 30th. <laughs>